lockdown at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been in lockdown, I think it was the week before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And they're still running it through. Um, but every five minutes, there's a new variant available. Yeah. So um, that's adding to things at the moment. Right. But it doesn't overly bother me that much anyway. I don't like people. So. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like people. I don't think that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, it, it is a bit tedious uh, here and there. So there are certain things we're trying to get on with that we can't at the moment. Right. Ah, here we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Everything good there, Bob? Speaking to me. Yeah. Yes, it's no problem. Um. Things just kind of clunk along here, and uh, I go out in the morning, and there's two groups of people that uh, meet for coffee, and, uh, oh. you know, we just visit, and then I come back here, and I work. I've been working very, you know, I'm, I'm gone for maybe an hour in the morning, and then maybe an hour and a half. That's it. So I've been really busy um, mm -hmm. doing a new version of Pinpoint uh, and also a new version of the scheduler both of which are fairly complex, so it keeps me hopping. And then our the inevitable new customer tech support helping, et cetera. So it's been great. My life is good. Uh, that's good. That's good. On the phone with Cesar Brello earlier, uh, and, uh, you know, I know that uh, he, you know, uh, he's, I, I think his family's having some, some issues with COVID, but... Um, you know, I think they're going to work through that. So we uh, had I have some COVID impact on uh, Explore Scientific too. And right after, I mean, we got through Christmas, but you know, the majority of phone calls to customer service happened after Christmas. And, um, and so we had a business increase that was up 10 <laughs> times over Christmas of last year. We had a big bump this year also. It was yeah, pretty amazing. Everybody did. If you were in the business or if you were uh, in an astronomy club or you would do an outreach or, you know, whatever you could do, uh, you know, you're going to see, you, you'll see a bump. I think even, I think Gary Palmer has been very busy with his classes, which is great. You know, um, we, uh, uh, Carlos Aragon might join us later. I'm not sure if he will or not, but he was on our daily show earlier today. His story is amazing. Uh, Carlos, uh, was in the, uh, was in the military and he had a, he got out on a medical discharge because he had damage, I guess, major damage to his shoulder. And, uh, and so he got, uh, you know, they gave him painkillers and he got, sorry about that. You guys hold yeah. on. Still there. Yeah. He got addicted to painkillers and became homeless. Wow. And a guy and someone found him behind a grocery store, dehydrated, almost dead. Okay. And, uh, kind of lifted him back up, took care of, you know, they nurtured him and, uh, well, there it is. Sorry. He ends up buying a telescope from Walmart, like a 60 millimeter telescope and discovers Jupiter with it. And that changes wow. his whole life. That changes his whole life. And now he's doing an astronomy outreach program. He cleaned up, you know, he's not, he's not an addict anymore. Uh, well, he's not addicted to painkillers anymore. And, um, uh, he's doing an amazing job. He's feeding homeless people. I think over the last couple of months, he, he gave uh, 14,000 meals wow. to homeless people in the Tucson, Arizona area. So that's really a wonderful amazing. story. It Scotty. is. It that is. really is. Yeah. So I've I remember started in, the nine, in the 1990s, I was uh, right around the time I was finishing up my biography of Clyde. I was actually um, thinking that I may become homeless, but that was in the 1990s. Things have Seriously. gone a wee bit better since then. Seriously, wow. You know, uh, um, Carlos told me, he said, it only takes one small thing to change your whole life. And, and you know, you can go from having a normal life to being completely homeless. And, uh, and that's the story of most homeless people. He says he's met lawyers and doctors and 
uh, you know, uh, all kinds of people that are uh, that are homeless now. And uh, so it's, um, uh, you know, uh, the a lot of these guys that will be logging on right now, uh, watching us uh, heard this program earlier today, and it's it's phenomenal. Um, I told him this was a, a secret project I've had for a while that I wanted to start a book. I've never written a book before. I've written a chapter. I've done some forwards and stuff like that. But I've never written a book before. And this book is about how astronomy can uh, change you and be better for your life. And uh, uh, I'm running into all kinds of people that this has happened to. You know, Vivian White's one of them. Uh, uh, you know, Shelley Bonus is another one. Uh, you know, I mean, Carlos's story is very dramatic. Um, but I, I believe that astronomy is, is, good for, is good for everybody, no matter what condition you're in, no matter what, how old you are. You know, uh, once you really get in, you know, past this tipping point and you really start, you know, exploring and asking yourself the big questions or asking other people the big questions, uh, you know, then, then you know that you're really learning, you know, and, uh, I know you guys do it all the time. You know, you're, you're, you live it. This is your life, you know, uh, for others, they, um, it's like there's dust in their eyes or something and, and they haven't, they don't understand that they're, living on this spaceship earth you know so so it's uh so i think i think a book like that is um i, I think there have been other books like this but uh there can't be too many <laughs> so <laughs> yeah and and i want i want this to be a collaborative book you know where different people write a chapter you know Pekka in Sweden says, so what have we learned of this pandemic? Next time someone gets a flu, get a warehouse full of gears and gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> so right now we have James, the astrophotographer, uh, chatting here with us. Um, uh, Book Davies is with us, Aaron Thompson. So, and I will start sharing to the groups I belong to. But it's great to that's what I'm doing right now is posting the link out thank on thank you a couple places yeah and those of you watching right now if you would so kindly share the program it would be great um, this is an astronomy outreach effort for all of us Wendy says hello to everybody She's at the other part of the room right now, but oh, she says hello everybody. to everyone. Hello, Wendy, back from Wisconsin. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm here with <laughs> She can hear you. There's lots of groups about astronomy, you know, Bolivia, there's uh, groups all over the world. <clears throat> astronomy, meteorology in France, here it is. Supernova Enthusiast Group. Uh, Dogs and Cats of Astronomy. How about that one? I created a, another Instagram page uh, 
to with just pictures of my cats I call it Shana Molly cats <laughs> 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 and I'm, I'm working on uh, I'm gonna put I'm gonna um, make pictures of my cats on top of my astro images so like cats in space <laughs> love it <laughs> I'll, I'll take my cat out she has a she my cat has a stroller and uh, I'll put her in there I'll take her out in the yard with me Oh my and so she'll sit out there and do something. I really want to build a um, like a cat enclosure and have a, a tube that goes down from my bedroom window down to the cat enclosure so that they can be outside without. Like, Dear space friends, welcome back to my video log. I'm ESA astronaut Matthias Mauder, and I've been training at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Texas, preparing for a space flight in 2021. Today, I will introduce you to what kind of psychological and physical support we receive while being in space. And um, so we will talk a little bit about what kind of space food we get while on station and how we train to remain fit. Enjoy. On board the ISS in the American-European-Japanese segment is the galley. That is a dedicated rack in Node 1, which features an oven, a hot cold water dispenser, and like your kitchen at home, it's where we prepare all our food. Like everything on station, we must be properly trained in the use of this facility before we fly. Before our mission, we are able to taste the huge selection of available space food in a NASA space food lab and choose what we like best. The food lab specialists even help us to fulfill individual wishes, such as adding new food from our home country. Here we taste European and Japanese food, which is all outstanding. The food comes usually in cans or pouches. If it is dried food, then we add water before we can eat it. In general, I prefer the thermostabilized dishes over the dried space dishes because they taste slightly better. For my mission, I plan to make my own yogurt in space, but I'm not yet sure if I will achieve this. <clears throat> being in space means being weightless. Our human body is very clever and reacts almost immediately to these altered conditions. It starts to reduce and dissolve many muscles and bones that we don't use in microgravity. But that is not good. We want to maintain all muscles and bones strong for our return to Earth. Astronauts perform two hours of physical exercise every day in space. One hour fitness and cardio training and one hour strength training via weightlifting against an hydraulic force in microgravity. Since we have been using the special weightlifting device, all astronauts have returned home in much better physical condition than in the past. Even if it is more difficult to set up and configure, it is definitely an important training tool for us in space. By the way, the blue suit that I wear here is a special suit with electrodes in the first test of an experiment which might fly with me in space. My training includes how to use these devices correctly for my exercises in space, but also how to repair and adjust them since we are the only mechanics in space for our sports equipment. Another training device is a treadmill, we call it T2. In this case, in weightlessness, we have to keep ourselves attached to the base surface using some bungees, which pull us with almost our body weight onto the bed. And then, when in space, we even can run on the wall or on the ceiling, because there's no up and down. The last device is the Seavis bicycle, which was made in Europe, in Denmark. Interestingly, this bicycle has no saddle in space. Cycling is one of the oldest exercising devices we have in space. In the few spare moments I have here at the Johnson Space Center, I also love to walk around within the compound. The number of personnel on site is still very limited due to COVID-19, and the local wildlife is having a great time without too many humans around. It's quite amazing to see deer and other animals happily roaming around undisturbed. And that's all for today. I hope you're all keeping fit and healthy as well. Stay tuned until next time. Bye.
Well, hello, everybody. Uh, we are um, uh, joined by um, our, many of our regular uh, group of, uh, in fact, all of our regular group of uh, Global Star Party attendees. Uh, and um, it is, uh, it's awesome to uh, spend time with you today um, uh, uh, to uh, bring the 29th Global Star Party. And so, uh, uh, to my right here, uh, as I see it on the screen, I've got Bob Denny. Uh, Bob has joined us for oh, at least half a dozen, maybe more, global star parties at this point. Uh, he always tells me he's not an astronomer, that he's a technologist, uh, but Bob Denny has done a lot for amateur astronomy and professional astronomy, and so we really value having him on our program. We have you, Carol sir. Orge. Yeah, thank you, Bob. We have uh, Carol Orge, uh, the president of the Astronomical League with us. Um, uh, Carol uh, will uh, uh, participate by uh, reading off questions for the uh, uh, questions and answers for the last uh, Global Star Party. Um, but I think actually you guys already did that. So uh, you already gave out prizes at your at your uh, last event. So uh, but um, I'm not sure of that. You, you'll you'll tell me when when we get to you. <laughs> we have Deepti Gautam from Nepal. Uh, Deepti is extremely active in uh, uh, astronomy in Nepal um, and uh, uh, created her own um, astronomy club in her high school. But she also belongs to the uh, adults uh, program in Nepal as well. So I think that's fantastic. Deepti, thanks for coming on the program here. Um, uh, then we've got David Eicher, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Astronomy Magazine, author, uh, written lots of books, is someone that has inspired amateur astronomers for decades, and he himself uh, has uh, lived this life of, of, of in, you know, uh, exploring the night sky and uh, writing about it uh, to uh, keep people um, and, you know, inspired going. It's been he has offered much of the fuel uh, of the uh, that that has been used by the community of amateur astronomers for a long time, and so it's really cool. Uh, we had the Ast Astro Beard, uh, Richard Grace, and uh, uh, he has uh, joined. I think almost all global star parties. Is that right, Richard? All the Tuesday ones. Howdy, all. The Tuesday ones. Okay. All right. There's been others, but. Uh, but that's good, you know, and so uh, Richard is, uh, uh, you know, uh, very enthusiastic astrophotographer, has been made some great images, and it's been awesome to see him uh, improve almost every show. So it's been, it's been incredible, and I think an inspiration for people who are getting into astrophotography. Uh, then we have Molly Wakeling. Molly's in the Bay Area of uh, California astrophotographer. She's been many, on many of our programs. Uh, she has quite a following on social media as well. And uh, uh, she is, um, she's a scientist. Uh, she is uh, uh, someone that has devoted uh, her life in many different ways to science and astronomy, and we love having her on. So uh, next is Libby in the stars. Libby is, uh, has just turned 11 years old recently. Uh, when she started on our program, she was only 10, and uh, she is, uh, I don't even know. Do you Have you been keeping count how many times you've uh, given lectures, Libby? No, I have not. <laughs> you have not? Okay. Well, she presented me with like 56 lectures, okay, mm -hmm. that she wanted to do. So, um, and then... Uh, uh, and then next is David Levy. David uh, has done every every broadcast we've done. Uh, he's done all the Tuesday Global Star Parties. He's done all of our special events. Uh, I have not seen anyone do uh, more lectures, more uh, uh, programs than David. He probably holds some sort of world record for uh, presentations and involvement in amateur astronomy. And it's awesome to have him on every day. He's a dear friend. Uh, a, a great author has written many, many books. Has attended more star parties than I can count, and uh, so it's, he's a, a mentor, a brother, uh, just all of the above. It, it, fantastic, uh, 
uh, gentleman, and uh, everybody that's met him uh, has, uh, has felt the uh, special spirit of David Levy. Uh, Bob Denny, um, well, I already mentioned Bob. It's actually different than what I see here from Zoom to what I see on, on uh, social media here, so a little bit different. But the last one here is Gary Palmer. Uh, Gary um, is uh, in the UK, and Gary has done incredible astrophotography, uh, incredible image processing. He teaches the, uh, how, how to get the very best out of your equipment and to make, uh, you know, iconic level uh, uh, astrophotographs. So through his Gary Palmer astronomy uh, education series and all the rest of the stuff that he does. Um, I know that we were talking earlier and he said he's on lockdown, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad he's here to join us and join our audience, our worldwide audience uh, tonight. And so, and thank you to all the people that are watching right now and all the people that will be watching this program and replay. Uh, we get many thousands that come in afterwards, after the fact, because of time zones or whatever, but uh, we're glad that you participate here too. So uh, why don't we get started first, as we traditionally do with David Levy, um, who uh, will give us a, uh, you know, that this, the special, uh, um, you know, this special, you know, I don't want to call it an effect. It's he, you know, he, when he starts these global star parties, he presents them in a way that, uh, that really gets you, that gets your heart going, gets your mind going, gets your imagination going. And, and through, through the, the poetry that he, that he tells us his, his own personal, uh, uh, you know, experiences um, and all the rest of it. Uh, he does it in, in only the way that David Levy can do it. So, David, thank you so much. And you have the stage. You know, Orion all, almost always comes up sideways, throwing a leg up over our fence of mountains and rising on his hands. He looks in on me, busy outdoors by lantern light, with something I should have done by daylight. And indeed, after the ground is frozen, I should have done before it froze. And a gust flings a handful of waste leaves on my smoky lantern chimney to make fun of my way of doing things, or else fun of Orion's having caught me. Thanks, uh, thanks, Scotty. And uh, today's poetic quote is uh, longer than usual. It's going to be uh, Robert Frost, the Star Splitter. I think you're going to enjoy this. It's a funny story about <clears throat> uh, Robert Frost, not the poet, but the, uh, but the amateur astronomer. He was a avid amateur astronomer. And uh, he was one of the United States' greatest poets. At John F. Kennedy's inauguration, speaking of inaugurations, he was the one that read a poem. He was actually going to write something specifically for it but i guess he did not so instead i think he read the gift outright and then later on he wrote another poem called gift outright of the gift outright but anyway he lived in vermont and i've had quite a bit of a history with vermont uh when wendy and i got together and wendy is right here right now uh wendy's parents had a country home in vermont that i enjoyed visiting a lot but perhaps more important was in three summers when I was a little boy of eight, I spent at Twin Lake Camp in Brandon, near, near Brandon, Vermont. I never got to meet Ro Ro uh, Robert Frost then, but uh, I've actually shared states with him. And uh, so we got started with this. Um, I have never taken a course in astronomy but I have spent a lot of time trying to understand the relationship between the night sky and my other love of English literature. And tonight will be the 1830th time that I've quoted from this magic book. I'm now going to show it to you. It's, this is the cover. There are over a hundred poetic quotations in this book. And tonight's is the star splitter. 
as a man, I should like to ask no rights these forces are obliged to pay respect to. So Brad McLaughlin mingled reckless talk of heavenly stars with hugger mugger farming. I am I having failed at hugger mugger farming. He burned his house down for the fire insurance and spent the proceeds on a telescope to satisfy a lifelong curiosity about our place among the infinities. What do you want with one of these blame things? I asked him well beforehand. Don't you get one? Don't call it blame. There isn't anything more blameless in the sense of being less a weapon in our human fight, he said. I'll have one if I have, if I have to sell my farm to buy it. That's where he moved the rocks to plow and plowed between the rocks he couldn't move. Few farms changed hands. So rather than spend trying to sell his farm and then not selling, he burned his house down for the fire insurance and bought the telescope with what it came to. He had been heard to say by several, the best thing that were, the best thing that were put here for us to see, the strongest thing that's given us to see with a telescope. Someone in every town seems to me owes it to the town to keep one. In Littleton, it may as well be me. After such loose talk, it was no surprise what he did with what he did, what he did and burned his house down. Me and laughter were about the town that, that did to let him know we weren't the least imposed and he couldn't wait. We'd see to him tomorrow, but the first thing next morning we reflect one by one, we counted people out for the latest sin. It wouldn't take us long to get. So we had no one left to live with. For to be social is to be forgiving. Something that I think a lot of us might want to pay attention to these days. Our thief, the one who does our stealing from us, we don't cut off from coming to church suppers, but that we miss but, but what we miss, we go to him and ask for. He probably gives it back. That if it's still uneaten, unworn out, or undisposed of, it wouldn't do to be hard on Brad about his telescope. Beyond the age of being given one for a Christmas gift, he had to take the best way he knew how to find himself in one. Well, all we said was, he took a strange thing to be roguish over. Some sympathy was wasted on the house a good old timer dating, dating back along. But a mouse isn't sentient. The house doesn't feel anything. And if it did, why not regard it as a sacrifice and an old fashioned sacrifice by fire instead of a new fashioned one at auction? Out of a house and so out of a farm at one stroke of a match. Brad had to turn to earn a living on the Concord Railroad as under ticket agent at a station where his job, where he wasn't selling tickets, was setting up on track and down, not plants as on a farm, but planets, evening stars that varied in their hue from red to green. He got a good glass for $600. His new job gave him leisure for stargazing. Often he bid me come and have a look in the brass barrel, velvet black inside, of a star sparkling at the other end to reflect a night of broken clouds and indeed, and indeed down to him. And melting further in the wind to mud, Bradford and I had out the telescope. We spread our two legs as we spread its three, pointed our thoughts the way we pointed it and standing at our leisure till the day broke said some of the best things we ever said. That telescope was christened the Star Splitter because it didn't do a thing but split a star in two or three, the way you'd split a globule of quicksilver in your hand with one stroke of your finger in the middle. It's a Star Splitter if ever there was one and ought to do some good at splitting stars. It's a thing to be compared with splitting wood. We've looked and looked, but after all, where are we? Do we know any better where we are and how it stands between the night to night and a man with a smoky lantern chimney? How different from the way it ever stood. 
And back to you now, Scotty. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. That's awesome. Um, uh, I don't think I've ever heard the Star Splitter before, and it's it's actually a very funny story. <laughs> so, but uh, I think there's probably more than one astronomer who might burn down their house to get a new telescope. So. <laughs> so. Well, don't burn down your business, Scotty, to get a new okay, telescope, right, okay. please. <laughs> Oh, anyhow. Um, well, that's great. Um, I, uh, I'm the next up, I'm going to introduce uh, David Eicher. But before I do, I thought we might take a peek at uh, a live image. And I think Molly Wakeling might have something already uh, set up for us. Is that right? I do indeed. Okay, you want to share go. that for a couple of minutes here and yeah, so um, I've got the moon in here. It's still uh, still pretty bright outside over here on the west coast. Uh, it's uh, 5:20, so got a bit of a ways to go before I can get anything uh, deep sky object wise. But the moon is so bright that you can see it really at any time. And we've got our uh, uh, waxing. Uh, well, I, I guess you can call it it. We wouldn't really call it a crescent at this point. We're not quite at first quarter yet, though. So. <laughs> waxing right. moon here. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. And yeah. what kind of system, what, what kind of, what's your rig that you're using? Is it the one that I see um, in the uh, below? Yes, yeah, so, so okay. it's one of the picture there. That's my eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain. I have a focal reducer on there because I use it for deep sky imaging. And I have a monochrome camera on there right now with, uh, with a full set of filters. And it's just on the light pollution filter right now. Excellent. That's great. That's great. Molly, thank you. Yeah. We'll see more from Molly later. Okay, so next up here is um, is uh, David Eicher. And uh, David is uh, uh, someone I love having on this program. Uh, he is, um, uh, you know, you're, you are an inspiration to so many people. I, I think that probably uh, over the years, if I just mentioned the name Dave Eicher, uh, in connection with anything to do with astronomy, your name would be instantly recognizable. Uh, you have uh, you have befriended many people, uh, no matter what level of amateur astronomy that they're in, uh, and uh, you know. And I know that you are uh, mm -hmm. you know rubbing elbows with uh, so many professional astronomers uh, that. Uh, uh, you know, you've gained the respect of the whole astronomical world, I think. And, um, you know, I love your books, love your Galaxies book. Um, and uh, I, I haven't yet seen the new book that you did with uh, collaboration with Brian May. Uh, so I, I and what, what's the name of that book again? It's like a... I will have to send you one, Scott. I'm sorry about that. It's called Cosmic Clouds. <laughs> I will buy one. <laughs> no problem. And Th thank you for the very nice words, as as always, and thank you for the commercial. I didn't intend that, but but uh, it, there's a there's a brilliant astro imager in Finland, whose name is J. P. Metsavainio, and he has created the first really credible, very well done simulations of stereo views, three D views of nebulae. So it's a really cool book, and it comes with Brian's, you know. Uh, owl glasses abound into the book as well. So you can really, and it's amazing when you look at nebulae three-dimensionally, how different they appear as opposed to the way we've seen them for 20 or 30 or 40 years. You know, they really look interesting when sure. you see the shapes three-dimensionally of nebulae. So I'll, I'll send you one of those, Scotty. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, uh, one of the people that watches our program regularly says clear, his name is, uh, his handle is clearlight58. He said, David did a great talk on galaxies last week for the astronomy club that I'm a member of here in the Boston area. So mm -hmm. uh, it's nice that you're getting out to all these clubs and organizations all over the country and all over the world. So it's a great, great old uh, club, of course, the Boston ATMs of Boston. Yeah, great club. Great. OK. All right. Well, it's all yours, David. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott, as, as always. And, and it's, what a pleasure it's been to know uh, some of you, Scott and David, for many, many, many years, and uh, just getting to know some of, of you as well. It's a, 
It's what makes astronomy fun, the people, of course. But uh, uh, tonight I'd like to talk a little bit more about objects, not people. And uh, we're moving a little farther out into the galaxy here, uh, exploring what we know about various classes of things. So I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about exoplanets, extra solar planets. Few areas of astronomy, of course, have exploded in recent times, uh, like the cottage industry of exoplanet discoveries. There are, as of today, 4,395 confirmed exoplanets in 3,242 planetary systems. That's a lot of planets. We have either nine planets, as some of us believe, some would even say eight in our solar system. Uh, so there, there are quite a few planets that we're discovering, of course, orbiting other stars out around us in the Milky Way galaxy. The pace of discovery has been so fast in the past uh, number of years that it's changed often from week to week, which means that uh, one needs to keep checking on it to see what's happening. The most productive discovery tool for exoplanet research has been the Kepler Space Telescope, which operated from 2009 to uh, 2018, and it found more than a thousand planets just with that orbiting instrument. The current key mission that's uh, zooming away right now is the TESS uh, telescope, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite, and it is surveying the brightest stars uh, near Earth, relatively near Earth. The upcoming key mission that involves exoplanetary research is the James Webb Space Telescope that has a different uh, spectral uh, coverage, but is, is in some senses, if you will, a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And I have talked recently because we're working on something a number of times with John Mather, who is the project scientist of the Webb Space Telescope. And he says, we're going to launch the Webb Space Telescope in October. Wow. He's sticking by that. It has been delayed uh, in a big way twice, and uh, it's NASA's big, big project that is on the launch pad this year. So he claims we're going to see that launched uh, this fall, maybe when we'll have a, a more or less normal world back. Ideas about exoplanets first arose with the Italian uh, philosopher in the 16th century, Giordano Bruno. Um, he believed that stars may well be fiery burning bodies like the sun that could have planetary systems orbiting. And what did that get Giordano Bruno? It got him burned at the stake. So exoplanet research isn't always a safe business to be in. Um, but nowadays, generally it is. The first claims of a planet orbiting another star really in a serious way came in the 19th century, uh, a dark body uh, affecting the motion of the star 70 Ophiuchi, that's a relatively close star to us. Uh, in 1855, uh, a later a claim about 100 years later in the 1950s, Peter van de Kamp at the Spruill Observatory uh, outside of Pittsburgh uh, claimed that he had found a planetary companion orbiting another very close star to us, the famous Barnard star. Both of those claims, however, were discredited. So when did we really get into the business of finding exoplanets? It was 1992 and Alexander Wolschan and Dale Frail, they discovered a planet orbiting the pulsar, a rapidly rotating neutron star, PSR B1257 plus 12. Don't worry, there's no quiz at the end of this. That was the first extrasolar planet ever found and confirmed. And three years later, in 1995, Michelle Mayor and Didier Kahlo, they found an extrasolar planet, more excitingly, if you will, orbiting 51 Pegasi, which is a sun-like G-type star. It's, a, it's a, a, about 51 light years away. So in the wake of the uh, sun-like star having another planet, that was a big, big deal in 1995. And that really got the worldwide attention and got the business of a huge wholesale um, industry, if you will, of, of going out and looking for exoplanets. It also coincided really with the availability of more powerful instrumentation and developing several uh, clever techniques to find these planets. 
There are four or five major techniques just to go through them very quickly. The most important uh, two are the first ones. One is radial velocity. As a star moves relative to Earth, it's possible to de de detect a wobble uh, because of gravity, the gravity of the orbiting planets around that star. Um, variations in the velocity can be detected with spectrometers. So the radial velocity method is an important one. Another one is transit photometry. That is, as a planet passes in front of its host star, it dims the light somewhat, and that can be detected rather straightforwardly. There's also gravitational microlensing when a star and its planets lie directly in front of a background star. Their gravity can actually affect the light of the distant star uh, belying the existence of a planet in that system. In rare cases, a few uh, exoplanets have been discovered also by direct imaging uh, or by the timing of pulsar variations, as I mentioned, that very first exoplanet that was discovered. So although astronomers have found several thousand exoplanets thus far, this is an experiment that's still very much in its infancy. TESS is off and running. It's looking at nearby stars. That's kind of the big deal at the moment. Uh, Kepler, um, if you will, it, it discovered several thousand uh, candidates and one more than a thousand confirmed exoplanets. But Kepler was really looking at a very small area of sky, about 10 by 10 degrees on the sky. So that's an area of sky that is between essentially the constellations Cygnus and Lyra. Surveys thus far have been limited uh, to finding mostly or weighted, no pun intended, toward finding mostly massive planets uh, because of, like gas giants or ice giants in our solar system, uh, limited by developing sensitivity still. Um, and they've largely been limited to looking at stars, all of these techniques within a few hundred light years. So we're really just taking the first steps with exoplanet discovery and cataloging. The galaxy's disk, the Milky Way's disk, as we know, is at least 100,000 light years across, uh, maybe larger. There are some studies about that going on right now. Um, and we've looked, generally speaking, a few hundred light years away at, at many stars. So we're just scratching the surface of this notion. And on top of our galaxy, the Milky Way, as we know, uh, if we read our books the way we should be, sorry for that, um, there are at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Wow. Another little plug there. Sorry about that. I, the <laughs> dinner's getting to my head. Forgive me. So we've really just barely scratched the surface of this issue, and we've already found several thousands of planets. What we're finding is that the universe is teeming with planets. Yeah. Uh, again, we're finding that although long ago, humans have a long record of feeling like we're incredibly special, we're in the center of everything, as you probably know. We're not necessarily special at all, and we're not in the center of anything. In fact, the universe has no center. So that's the most exciting finding that we could hope for. And it may be that there are thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of planets just in our galaxy that are habitable, um, that are in so-called habitable zones of stars. So the curious question, of course, looking out toward exoplanet research and making it more mature is, is there a lot of life out there amongst these mm. planetary systems? Certainly the indications are very encouraging for uh, on the side of people like our old pal, Carl Sagan, who used to think that there must be life everywhere out there in the cosmos, uh, but the distances are so vast that we will not shake hands with it. So that's kind of our update for the moment on where we stand with exoplanets and we'll get another big boom if we launch Webb at the end of this year. Absolutely. So I, I, I think that James Webb is supposed to launch October 31st. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Okay. Yep. And you can read about, hey, there's a uh, be shameless tonight. Normally I don't talk about this stuff, but yeah. I, I'm really bad tonight, but 
John Mather is right, who's the project scientist, the director of the telescope, if you will, is writing a preview story that will be a very exhaustive and detailed preview story that you'll see in Astronomy Magazine in a few months. Wow. And so how, I mean, regarding James Webb, how long has it just been sitting around ready to launch? <laughs> it's been a while. Hasn't it, it? It's been a couple years now. Yeah. 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 So, so it is a very complex thing and God help us for even mentioning this, you know, it has to go up and then deploy in a very rather tricky way. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll cross our fingers and hope for the best uh, because if it doesn't deploy correctly, we're, we're in trouble, but it should be a piece of cake. The engineers believe compared to something like landing a spacecraft on Mars with on air. Mars. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So We'll hope that everything goes okay because it will be the next generation Hubble. Not only will it do a lot with exoplanets, um, it will do an incredible amount with imaging the universe in a deeper way. And one of the major reasons this telescope was built, of course, is to answer the formation sequence, which we don't know in the early universe. Did stars, galaxies, or black holes come first? And how did the first galaxies and stars and black holes form? So that's a question that Webb is supposed to solve after a time for us as well, which will be fundamental to our understanding of cosmology. Very interesting. Very interesting. I I wanted, since we're plugging at this point, I, I also <laughs> wanted to plug um, uh, David Kipping, who's a researcher uh, at Columbia University is going to be on a special program on the um, 29th of January uh, here on Explorer Alliance Pre Presents. And he's doing work on exo moons. And so oh, yes. you can imagine trying to, you know, ferret out uh, an exoplanet. Imagine trying to get yes. detection of a moon going around one of these planets. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that's... Uh, so very, very interesting, but it just shows you what, uh, you know, what the human race is doing, you know, as far as trying to understand our solar, uh, other solar systems, our solar system, the universe at large. And uh, you've said many, many times, David, we are living in the golden age of astronomy. This is it. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. There's never been a better time to be interested in astronomy no question by an order of magnitude yeah, you know yeah. the good old days they always talk about yeah this is the good old days, good old days. Astronomy. <laughs> you're in the right place at the right time yeah. that's right that's right well that's awesome so um uh let's see uh i would like to switch over to uh richard grace if he's got uh, something live in his telescope uh to show us what uh what we have, and then we're going to uh, we're going to go to uh, DT Gautam in Nepal, and uh, wow, this looks like the Orion Nebula. Look at this! Wow, beautiful. I like that effect. Yeah, I got it from watching your intro. <laughs> No, uh, this is uh, as, as close to first light on the 2600 as we're getting. Uh, it's looking good. Let's see. We got uh, it's live stacking. That's uh, five uh, five minute images. Uh, I'll probably uh, move somewhere else after this. Wow. But, so this, uh, is, this is first light on a new camera that you have, right? Well, last night was technically first light, but I spent okay. more time figuring out what was going on and messing with some stuff. And uh, I actually got to collimate the newt a little bit. It's uh, It seems to be harder to collimate when it's cold outside. I'm not sure why. Yeah, maybe because <laughs> it's freezing. <laughs> but uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah I got a little bit of issues with the uh, with that. Let's see. Uh, there's one other picture I wanted to show here. This is, did it just go away? It just went away. I don't understand. That was like a tease. Yeah, it, it really, really was. <laughs> Now, what is this that you're going to show us? Uh, let's see. This is the the new setup. What? Look at this. Oh, gosh. Geez. Teasing again. <laughs> Just trying to grab this corner. Look at all the cradle rings on this Newtonian telescope. It says David Levy on the on the tube. <laughs> 
Yeah, what? It does. <laughs> oh my god. It's a David Levy comet hunter. That's right. Yeah, an explorer scientific uh David Levy yeah. comet hunter. Wow. There oh, we go. Look all those that. clamps, the thing's not going anywhere. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I, I got to put some rings on the 80 because I still got a little bit of movement. Uh, yeah. That's that's next on the list is to uh, strap that down real good. But uh, my guiding has significantly improved uh, going from a 200 millimeter guide scope with a 120 uh, to the uh, the ED80 with a focal reducer uh, to 400 with the 183. The pixel size is... Uh, match to the scope quite well and it is mm -hmm. helping mm -hmm. beautiful so you you run it with the camera in that up position or do you usually rotate the newtonian so that it's facing the, the camera's facing the ground uh i run it in the up position and you can't really see too much but the saddle plate that's bolted to the top of it is actually off center slightly uh, so the ED80 is slightly off to the right to actually balance it for the focuser and the camera. And it does a pretty good job of it. And I do know that if I turned it upside down that I could, uh, I could definitely have better weight balance. I'm running 30, seven, 37 pounds of weights on it right now. Uh, but even if I did it upside down like that, then I'd have trouble setting it down when I take down every night and stuff like that. Uh, just because it sits nice and flat on the big Lowe's Mandy plate on the bottom. So it's uh, easy to set down when, uh, when it finally lives its life in an observatory one day, it probably will get switched around. Yeah. But uh, right now it's just nice to be able to park it somewhere. It looks impressive. It really does. Thank you. Um, I like the color scheme. I'm going to stop sharing here. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So um, our next speaker is Deep T. Gautam. Uh, Deep T is uh as I mentioned earlier, is from Nepal, and uh, she's uh, very involved in uh, science and astronomy in uh, in her country. And um, uh, she has uh, she's really uh, inspired uh, a lot of youth in her uh, both in her school and I think probably around the world. Um, so, DP, it's great to have you back on our program again. And um, what is your presentation today? Um, I, um, I make the presentation about the star and the uh, term related to star and its formation. Okay. Okay, um, talking about the star, uh, I remember the uh, things of my childhood uh, when we start, uh, when I read in class 11 or grade 11, uh, grade grade 1, and uh, the teacher says, first time when we were small, child will engineer level of education. And uh, teacher has taught us about the, what the star is. That uh, star are huge glowing ball of uh, gases, and the uh, closest star to the Earth, the Sun. And I remember that uh, first time we read this definition in our star. But uh, being practically and others asking to this parents and uh, our the uh, this uh, belief over the beliefs over the stars. My grandmother, grand, grandma used to say that the star are the, uh, are the, uh, the signing this uh, memory of the dead person of our own, the dead person of our own. That's the belief uh, that she believed in that what the star is. And after reading about the star, after ge uh, getting the knowledge uh, by the help of internet and uh, by the curriculum and, and uh, we got to know what the actual star is and how it's formed. Uh, and um, uh, let's talk about the end. The, the storm we know is the main sequence. What's the main sequence is? The main sequence uh, is a continuous and uh, distinct, uh, distinctive band of the star that appears on float of stellar colors and bursts uh, its brightness. And our sun will stay in this uh, mature phase on this main sequence uh, for approximately 10 billion years. And uh, about the uh, red giant, uh, red giant is a luminous giant star of uh, lower intermediate mass in late phase of stellar evolution. And the outer atmosphere is uh, inflated and tenuous. Uh, making the radius large and the surface temperature around 5,000 Kelvin uh, and or lower. And the red giant uh, contains the hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, and carbon, neon, uh, 
magnesium, silicon sulfur, nickel, iron, etc. And uh, talking about the supernova, what's the supernova is? Uh, supernova is a powerful and luminous stellar explosion. And uh, this uh, transient uh, astronomical event occurs uh, uh, during the last evolutionary uh, stage of a massive star or uh, when a white dwarf is triggered into runaway uh, nuclear fusion. And um, in a supernova, the star's uh, core collapse and then explodes. About 25 to 50 supernovas are discovered each year in other galaxies, but uh, most are too far away to be seen without a telescope. So we need a telescope to see the supernova. And uh, talking about the nebula, uh, a nebula is an interstellar cloud of uh, dust, hydrogen, helium, and other ionized gas. And um, originally, the term was uh, used to describe any diffuse astronomical object, uh, including the galaxy uh, beyond the Milky Way. That's called the nebula. And uh, let's continue to the term, uh, what the neutron star is. A uh, neutron star uh, is the collapsed uh, core of massive supergiant star, which had a total mass of between uh, 10 and 25 solar masses, and uh, possibly more if the star was especially metal rich. And uh, neutron star are also have powerful magnetic field, uh, which can be accelerate uh, atomic particles around its magnetic pole, and producing powerful beam as the uh, star rotates. If uh, such a beam is originally uh, oriented uh, so that um, so that it periodically point uh, toward the Earth, and we observe it as a regular pulses of radiation that occurs whenever the magnetic poles uh, sweeps past the line of sight. And in the case of uh, in the case the neutron star is also known as a pulsar, and uh, we are uh, not about that. So what the pulsar is, and uh, uh, talking about the white, white dwarf, uh, what's the white dwarf is actually, uh, for average, a uh, star like the sun, the process of ejecting its outer layer continues uh, until the stellar core is exposed. Uh, the dead but the still furiously hot stellar uh, centers is called white dwarfs. And white dwarfs, uh, which are roughly the size of our Earth, uh, despite containing the mass of a star, one uh, once puzzled the astronomer why did not they collapse further uh, but uh, quantum mechanics provided the explanation about this and um, uh, pressure from most moving electron uh, keep this star from uh, collapsing uh, together and uh, as we are familiar about the black hole uh, black hole is a region of space time uh, where gravity is so strong that nothing no particles or no even electromagnetic radiation such as light uh, ca can escape uh, from it and the theory of uh, general relativity uh, predicts that a sufficiently compact mass can deform space time to form a black hole and uh, talking about all this uh, how let's uh, think how stars are born and stars are formed from giant uh, clouds of dust and gas and then from the gravity the uh, cloud collapsed into a rotating gaseous ball and after the collapsing uh, into a rotating uh, gaseous ball uh, the new star gets uh, hot enough it will begin to create energy from a process called nuclear fission and this created energy allows the stars to glow for millions of uh, billions and millions of the years and uh, similarly, the stars are born uh, within the cloud of dust and scattered throughout most galaxies. And our familiar examples of such a dust cloud is Orion Nebula. And uh, turbulence uh, deep uh, within this cloud uh, gives the uh, rises to north with sufficient mass that the gas and dust can uh, begin to collapse under its own gravitational attraction. And as the cloud collapses, the materials at the center uh, begin to heat up. And known as that, uh, it's known as the protostar. It's called the protostar. And it is the hot core at the heart of the collapsing cloud uh, that uh, uh, will one day become a star. And uh, three dimensional computers model of star formation predict that uh, the spinning cl clouds of collapsing gas and dust may break up into two or three bulbs. And uh, this will explain why the majority of the star in the Milky Way are uh, 
fear or in group um, it is and um i uh, was telling about all of this and here is something i have so yeah here is one picture uh, we saw the stellar evolution mm -hmm. how this uh, how this stellar evolution how the star are made of uh, the main sequence are uh, red super giant supernova and nebula main sequence red giant planetary nebula white dwarf etc and thank you this much yes E.T., I'm curious, you know, uh, a lot of us have um, something that really makes us fascinated about a process that's going on in the universe. Uh, in, this, in this talk about star formation, uh, what is it that fascinates you most about, about the life cycle of a star? Life cycle of the star, uh, over this, uh, this, uh, Obviously, the star are made of the uh, cloud formation, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that makes me fascinated over that. It's the it's the birth. Uh, yeah. It's the birth yeah, same the like yeah. the star, uh, the planets, and other uh, heavenly bodies have been uh, formed. Hmm. Interesting. Well, thank you very much, DT. That's awesome. Thank you for being on our program. We are going to. Uh, uh, I will introduce uh, Libby and the stars next. Uh, we are going to switch to Gary Palmer for a quick look at some image processing that he's doing. Um, Gary, thank you for, for coming on to our show and, and fitting us in. I know that you've been very busy uh, teaching people uh, image processing and astrophotography. Um, and I recently saw a great image of the horse head. Is, is that what you have to, uh, to show us tonight? Hi Scott. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, it's been uh, a really bad season. That is the only way I can put it. It's been the worst season, I think, since I've been in astronomy. Oh. So for winter uh, imaging, uh, it's been very, very limited in the UK, or certainly in this part of the UK. And I, I haven't seen masses of images coming out of lots of other places. So it's been slim pickings is the easiest way of putting it and grabbing an hour here and an hour there and um, sort of working on that side. So first thing I wanted to sort of run through, let me just run up the screen, was hopefully you can all see that okay. Um, presuming that's... Don't see an image yet, but we do see the... Uh... Right, so you see a blank image there at the moment. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, after we've done the uh, really the registration of images, I quite often um, select some different settings in the uh, image integration, which is where we bring all of the images together um, and start work on our, our um, uh, successive stack of images. Yeah. So having these in here, and we seem to be getting lots and lots of questions at the moment about Starlink and um, how it's going to uh, affect us sort of moving forwards with more and more satellites going up everywhere. But working in um, PixInsight does give you a lot of tools uh, to play around with. So by using sort of set settings in this area, and one of the main ones I use is the Windsor Eye Sigma Clipping. Other people use other different types, um, but this generally, if you've got over 10 images, works quite well. Um, and then setting the highs and lows by setting the Sigma low up around 9.1, anywhere between 8.8 .8 and 9.1, and then running the Sigma high up somewhere around 5.1. What that does is when it um, subtracts and integrates all of the images, if we actually look at the blank image that's on here now, this is a rejection um, of all of the satellites that is taken out of the image. Okay. So well, a while you're using this, this is one of the, the best tools um, against Starlink. And you can see from the whole stack, so each individual image that we've captured there has got something going through there. Um, whether it's an aeroplane or whether it's uh, satellites running through, and even the odd meteor, yeah, it will take out the image, even though you might want to keep that one in there. Um, but it does help out. Um, moving on to what we've done recently, that horse head image is about the only one we've had in the last two weeks. 
Um, we did manage to get uh, HA. This was done on the FCD 102 using a Starlight Express 694 Trius camera. Um, and that's just a HA filter. So it was about, um, I think there was somewhere around 15 images, 15 three minute images to get that. So it's turned out okay, but we just want the clear weather to get the rest of the data and turn it into a color image would be quite nice. But later on, we'll run through some error corrections, um, some optical corrections, um, and removing that from the images uh, where we get problems with different things, creating different uh, artifacts in the image. Excellent, beautiful. At the moment, there's not okay. a lot else going on. <laughs> well, that was uh, that was that was great uh, and exciting. Um, uh, you know, I love. I never get tired of seeing the Orion region. You know, it's just so. Uh, uh, although it, it it may be one of the most photographed uh, parts of the night sky. Uh, you know, to see the horses, the horse head, that that ridge of nebulosity that stretches across there. Uh, you know, so many light years, the flame nebula, the, you know, uh, and the Orion nebula, and even like wider shots, you know, where you can see that huge halo of, of, uh, of nebulosity all, all around Barnard's Loop. Uh, it's just uh, a fascinating uh, star birth region and just really gets my gears turning every time I see it. So that's awesome. There's a couple of targets in that area that I keep trying for and each year. We seem to be getting worse and worse through December and January on the weather. And it, it is a successive thing that we're seeing. And last year was the same thing. You, you're trying to do some narrowband imaging there. And you, you're just watching the months actually pass, not the, the odd night or the odd week. You're actually watching a month of time go past. And you seem to be missing these objects now. This isn't a case of you think, oh, I'll, I'll jump on them in a couple of weeks' time. You're really having to sneak in an hour or something like that um, very, very quickly um, and just build up the images over a course of time rather than one or two nights out. I don't know how other people are finding that at the moment, but we've certainly noticed it over the last two or three years. I see. I see. Well, people, especially, I mean, you've really had to work with... Uh with very little clear sky time, you know, so it's, it's stunning and amazing how productive you really are, even in those kind of adverse conditions. So, but, um, um, you know, and also too, with, with, um, uh, the pandemic, uh, adding a layer over all the whole, over the whole thing. So, uh, our next, uh, our next guest, we'll talk some more about that later on in this program, Gary, if you're still up for it. Um, uh, our next guest is uh, Libby in the Stars. Libby. Uh... Can I say something first, though, Scotty? Sure, of course. Yeah, Scotty, thanks. I just wanted to say, um, in uh, appreciation of Deep Tea's, uh, presentation, I really did enjoy that. It reminded me of an article I wrote for Astronomy Magazine. I understand there may be someone here who has knows about Astronomy Magazine. <clears throat> but anyway... Uh, that article was decades ago when Richard Berry was editor, mm. and it was about Betelgeuse. And uh, I began it by with the four words, stars are people too. Mm. And I met uh, R Richard Berry at Riverside that year, and he came up to me and he said, stars are people too. And he said, I read the first four art letters, the first four words of your article, and I accepted it without reading another word after that. <laughs> I don't care what you said after that. <laughs> I remember that, David. And then back in those days, we also got together there at the old astronomy and watched them blow up a freeway. Remember that? I'll never forget that. <laughs> but I wish you didn't throw me under it at the time. That, that's a story for another night, Scott. But okay. <laughs> it's another night. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. And I noticed that Rodrigo Zaleta from North Optics is with us tonight, so that's great. Um, uh, after uh, Deep Tea, we will have uh, Carol Orge from the Astronomical League uh, uh, do the, uh, uh, the door prizes and ask all those interesting questions that come from the, from the League officers there. So it'll be very cool. Um, 
we'll take a break and then we'll come back uh, to uh, uh, Rodrigo and uh, uh, we'll be doing some astrophotography uh, uh, carousel here. So that'll be fun. Um, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Libby. Uh, what's your presentation on today? You said it did you like the solar system and how it works because there's a lot of gravity on it. I thought it was very cool. Okay. Okay. I'm sharing. I made a presentation. I'm pulling that up. So here, let me present. So solar systems. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, so here's our solar system, the one that we know. It's the only solar system that we know right now that has life. And um, I know we do a lot of imaging on our solar system. We know it very well. Uh, from preschool, anyone can name the planets in order, basically. You know, our solar system very well. Um, there's also gravity, magnetics, like gravity and magnetics to talk about too. Um, it's also a big part of black holes too, and like radiation and stuff. So they're so like inside of our sun, inside of our sun is like a gravitational magnet, and it's able to pull our planets around with the gravity, which is super cool to think about because it's like, oh my gosh, that's out, that's actually real. <laughs> We're being pulled around by the sun in space, which is kind of crazy, which I thought was super cool. Um, and here's like a little scale about like how we're being like in our own orbit around the sun. And then we have a moon orbiting us. And it just shows how delicate our solar system is. Like with moons, planets, suns, and like maybe even as like Pluto, maybe even a dwarf planet. That shows how like intricate our <laughs> solar system is. It's so like so many objects that can be in a solar system. And we know our solar system very well, but there's also other solar, solar systems adding on to exoplanets. Uh, there's more solar systems out there that could have life. Um, and so I want to talk about the habitable zone because I watch NASA TV a lot and they talk about this 24-7. And I always, I always thought this is cool because I've always been interested in weather and it talks a lot about temperature. So if you're too close to the sun, like you would be freezing cold. No, not freezing cold, that's the opposite. You'd be hot, you'd be burning. And uh, if you were in the middle, you'd be like perfectly fine. I mean, maybe a little hot, maybe a little cold, just depends on how close you are in the middle and how close you are far out. And if you're far out, like away from the sun, you'll be very cool. So this is also important with weather uh, because like temperatures. So NASA is gonna send an astronaut to Mer Mercury in our solar system. The astronaut's gonna need a good spacesuit because facing towards the sun, it's going to be blazing hot. Almost as you can see in the picture there, there's a little flame reaching out for Mercury and that looks torching hot. <laughs> uh, so that's also important with space travel and stuff. You have to make sure your astronauts are comfortable going on different planets because their spacesuits have to be durable. Because if it is too hot, then they can probably burn. But just really good spacesuits. And it's very cool to learn about if you're learning like about NASA and how they send astronauts up into space. And then, oh wow, that changed. But uh <laughs> Here's some planets that are just like Earth. Uh, NASA is looking forward to looking forward to sending like people to different planets, like full other Earths. And I kind of have this idea in my head since there's seven of them that each continent gets their own planet. <laughs> I have this idea in my head. It's kind of sci-fi, but it, uh, but those are planets that are just like Earth. They may not look just like Earth, but uh, they, they, they're perfect for humans to live on. They have good temperatures, they can grow plants, and if you work it on right, then you can live on those planets. And I have this fantasy idea that each, each continent will get their own planet. <laughs> uh, 
And then this is another solar system. I've talked a lot about our solar system that we know a lot. This is another solar system, which solar systems can be as crazy as possible. Like you can have 10 moons, like ama it's amazing how difficult, like how crazy they can be because all of them are so different. I think it's very unique. Because I'm so used to looking at stars through my telescope, and whenever I see a planet, it just has all these amazing colors, too. It's, it's very cool to look at other solar systems. And Did Antarcticans get a planet in the too cold zone? <laughs> the people on the, on the continent of Antarctica? <laughs> we'll, give them, we'll, get, we'll keep them the farthest away so they're like, used to it. They're not like, well, why is it hot? Uh, <laughs> we have an in, a image of an astronaut down here. And I was talking more about like how we can keep an astronaut in space on a different solar system because they're so different as I keep on saying. Um, I know NASA is trying to get to Mars right now. If you look on the scale in the solar system, Mars looks like a centimeter away from us but really it's gonna take three years to get there. And thinking that like in 30 years or so we'll be at Mars is kind of crazy. And uh, it's also kind of cool to think that we also wanna go to like the far reaches of the universe and it's gonna take us three years to get to Mars. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of storage to it too. You have to think about the astronauts while you're sending them up into space because you can't just be like, okay, grab your space suit, grab your supplies, you're going into space. You have to think of the place that they're going because uh, at space camp, we talked about solar systems and when you're sending an astronaut and they were talking about how much storage that the moon mission, the, not the moon mission, uh, Mars mission is gonna need because those astronauts are gonna need three years worth of supply so think about going to the grocery store and getting stuff for three years of your life, which you'll need tons of storage. And so uh, here's our solar system again, which is super cool. Thinking that there's a million solar systems out there is crazy and we're just one of them and we haven't even, and we're trying to get to one of our plants in our solar system and we haven't even gotten to another solar system yet is kind of crazy. So yes, I wanted to talk about solar systems a little bit on, you know, sending astronauts into space and you know, what's habitable. And you know, like, it's very cool because we're in a generation of space. You know, we're sending astronauts to Mars, which is like the next generation of the moon mission, which it's super, it's nice to know, like, what NASA is doing to keep the astronauts safe and what you can do in the future. And like what Na how NASA is gonna improve sending people into space so we can get into the far reaches of the universe. There you go. Libby, your, your <laughs> presentations get better every time you do them. So you're, you. you're getting very polished here. So that's great. That was really good, really good. Yeah. Thank you. I'm a virtual student. I have Google Slides etiquette. <laughs> it's very good editing skills. Yeah, yeah, but it's also being comfortable in front of an audience and and uh, really uh, translating your knowledge and everything. DT, uh, people think you have a photographic memory. Um, uh, you are. Yes. <laughs> very, very impressed. Isn't that the truth? They, they knew that you weren't really uh, looking at notes too much and. Uh, and really that you know your subject matter. So that's excellent, you know? So thank you for, for uh, coming on. And uh, I don't know, it's inspiring to me. So, well, next up here, uh, before we take our 10 minute break, will be uh, the president of the Astronomical League, Carol Orge. Uh, Carol uh, and the Astronomical League have been doing a, uh, a regular uh, program called Astron Astronomical League Live, and we've been um, we've been broadcasting these programs, and I I hope that it's uh, reaching people that uh, couldn't otherwise uh, uh, really get to the uh, 
uh, talks and stuff that the Astronomical League has to present. Um, but I want to turn it over to you. I know that uh, you'd like to have a little safety message about uh, looking at the sun before you get started. So I'll, I'll just let you um, have the stage here, Carol. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, though, it's very encouraging uh, the reach we're getting. And I'm sure all of our groups are getting the same phenomena of being able to reach many more people by Zoom than we ever could in person. So that's uh, most helpful. I was told that we need to go back to the previous star party and read those. Okay. Terry, Terry said read them, so therefore I must. Well, there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. There's the warning that uh, we uh, give. If you win a prize that is something like an eyepiece or something like that, then we want to make sure that you're not looking through the eyepiece at directly at the sun. So that's what that's about. Then we go back to the last Global Star Party, those three questions. The first question was, what well-known galaxy can be found near the star Alcade? And the answer is Messier 51, of course, also known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. The winner on that one was John M. Keogh. Oh, congratulations, John. Yeah, well done, John. Uh, let's see here. We... All right, the second one. What did I skip on there? I think I may have. Okay, the next one. If we could travel back in time to see another Jupiter and Saturn grand conjunction, on what date would be be able to see a closer alignment between those planets? And the answer is just before dawn on March the 4th, 1226. So wow. that's how we got the 800 years the media was talking about uh, before we had the other one. The winner is Dave Miski. Congratulations, Dave. All right, Dave. Then the last one. In December, the Hubble Space Telescope discovered this nebula was fading. What is the name of the nebula? The answer is, HEN 3, 1357, nicknamed the Stingray Nebula. And Harry Treese was the winner. Congratulations, Harry. All right, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where that came from, sorry. Uh, that, that was good though, it's right on clue. Okay, and then our questions for tonight. The first question is, this object to our left there, is found in the constellation Toucan in the southern skies. What is its name? All right, read that question again. Yeah, this object is found in the constellation Toucan in the southern hemisphere, southern okay. skies. What yeah. is its name? Okay. Everybody got that one. All right. right. Let's, let's go Are you supposed one. to be showing some slides right now? What's that? Are, are you are you trying to sh uh, are you supposed to be showing some slides? Right. Uh, you need to share your screen. Because we don't see them. We don't see them yet. But you go over there. Okay. That's right. Good call. Thank you, Molly. One more. Click. How's that? There you go. Okay, good. Much better. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay. The, so that's number one. Number two is looking at that image to the left again. There's a, this is a three-part question. The first part of it is, what is the name of the brighter object? And then secondly, what Messier object is that brighter object? And then the third one is, what is the number of the Messier object shown in the upper left corner of this image. So the third part, and I'll repeat those. What is the name of the brighter object right in the center or slightly below? Okay. B, uh, it's a Messier object. What is the Messier designation? And then the C, the third part of that is, what is the number of the Messier object shown in the upper left corner? Oh. Can, you, can you bring that full screen? Can you uh, change yes. your PowerPoint to full screen? Okay, see here. So we can see that image. Yeah. Uh, I think it'll be down at the bottom. 
Go down all the way down the bottom, bottom right hand side down there. I think you can go into presentation mode. Right on, right on the bottom. Yeah. There you go. Uh, uh, not sure I'm doing. Is it getting? Okay. Then number three. This nebula observed in the constellation Cepheus is officially cataloged as VDB 141 or SH2 136. Carol, we're still on the last slide. Still on the which one? We're on question number two. Okay. For some reason it's not sharing. Uh, Probably what he's done is he, he when, you, when, you, when you share your screen in Zoom and you select an app um, and you select PowerPoint, it will stay on. Ah, there, there we go. go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Got it. I'm also an amateur Zoom operator in addition to being an amateur astronomer. <laughs> All right, okay. so you're on question okay. number two. Okay, here we go. Now question I'll, I'll flash those back up in just a second so we can see them all. Okay, that's okay. cool. Yeah. Uh, number three, this nebula observed in the constellation Cepheus is officially cataloged as VD3, VDB 141 or SH2 136. What is its unofficial name? And I'm going to go back to one, we'll go through those again to make sure we got all those. Uh, there's number one, uh, the object found in the constellation Toucan in the southern skies. Okay. And then the second one, uh, what is the name of the bright object there in the center, slightly below center? And B, it's also a Messier object. What is the Messier number? And the third part, what is the number of the Messier object shown in the upper left? Okay. Okay. And finishing with uh, this nebula uh, observed in the constellation Cepheus is officially cataloged as VDB 141 or SH2 136. What is its unofficial name? And you need to send those to secretary, I didn't put it on the slide here, secretary okay. at astroleague.org. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did change the email address here. Right. But, uh, let's see, secretary. Yes, at, at astroleague.org. Astroleague. .org. Not Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com anymore. That's right. So um, Chris Larson uh, wanted to say thank you, Carol. He said he just joined the Astronomical League as a member at large earlier this month, and he's looking forward to starting his first observer program. So uh, we, got a, um, we got a great uh, uh, explanation of all the observer programs uh, at the last Astro Astronomical League live uh, presentation. So, and I imagine you guys will be covering all of those uh, programs again in future shows, but uh, um, uh, you guys do so much for the astronomical community worldwide. And, uh, uh, you know, it's great to have you on this program. Well, thank and you. We we're up to about, uh, we're about up to uh, 80 uh, different programs right now. So we're very pleased about that because there's something for everybody there. Thank uh, you, Scott. That must be more than any other uh, you know, federation or astronomy club has anywhere in the world. I think that that is correct. Yes. You know, so and if you, do, you become this, uh, you know, ultra master observer, which uh, as they also have a certificate for. Um, uh, and this year is this is it right? This year is the seventy fifth anniversary year. Yes, we are in the seventy fifth year right now, two thousand and twenty one, and we're having a lot of fun as we're going through this process because. Many of the archives, most of we people uh, in the league now have forgotten all about. So it's really fun. Uh, for example, we're finding out that there were youth organizations and lots of astronomy clubs back uh, in the early days of the Astronomical League. And here we are coming back, I think, and we're having uh, our younger astronomers on these kind of broadcasts. So it's really encouraging to see we're coming full circle about again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Carol. That's great. Okay, so we are going to take a 10 minute break. Um, 
so you can grab a sandwich and uh, um, you know get a drink or something and um, uh, we will be right back so that's great Okay, time to make me a sandwich. <laughs>
Okay, I'm fueled back up. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> if if you look in the I don't know, you probably can't see this. Well, never mind. There. On on right there where my hand is, can you see that? Or in right to the right of my head, I don't know which way, but you can see Stevie and I in this observatory. It's either on the left or right. I can't tell you which. It looks on the left here in Zoom and and uh, in um, let's see what it looks like here on Facebook. Um, yeah, I have my may off, have my off, thing off. muted. Yeah, it's off to the left. Mm hmm. That's a beautiful observatory. It's a college of the desert. It was given to them by a wealthy individual in Palm Desert. And uh, we were there for the first light a couple wow. of years ago because they're running our software for providing uh, observing to the students. Wonderful. Wonderful. It was a great experience. And, yeah. Talk about more of your, your adventures and mm -hmm. observatories. Uh, we are going to um, we are going to go to down to Chile uh, to uh, Rodrigo Zaleda, uh, who is an astrophotographer and um, uh, also the owner of North Optics in La Serena, Chile. And uh, uh, how how are you doing there uh, today, Rodrigo? Hi, Scott. Yeah. But uh, tonight I. Uh, put my equipment in the garden, but uh, a few minutes they close, uh, uh, they close in the sky. Oh, okay. But I I share with you my last photo of the uh, south object, um, the Eta Carina Nebula. Eta Carina. Okay. Uh, yes, it's a, a great object. Uh, this photo is um, two weeks ago, and. I check with you my my screen. Yes. There you go. Okay, Scott. Wow, look at that. You see my screen now? Yes. <laughs> this is two photos with uh, different uh, focal length of uh, mm -hmm. different telescope. Uh, this picture. More big is uh, four hours integration with um, a oh. upper refractor. Hmm? Wow. With a dual narrow band filter. For, uh, it's very dramatic. In this sector is the Eta Carini star. In, oh, I see. And this, this little nebula. In this sector is a high cold nebula. What is it called again? Esta, um, this this nebula? Yes. It's a, a dust for the explosion of the Eta Carina star. Homunculus. Uh, it's a. Um, the homunculus nebula. Oh, homunculus. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, K-hole, <laughs> yeah. Or uh, what is what is it in Spanish? Uh, Ojo de cerradura. Oh, good. Yeah. And this this photo. Is a white white field with a, a little refractor. Is uh, all Eta Cari Nebula, and and this nebula in this sector is a uh, uh, Gabriela Mistral Nebula, uh, in honor of a um, uh, uh, important uh, a poet, writer. right? Poet, writer, activist, something like that. Gabriela Mistral. Gabriela Mistral. Yes. yes. Uh, this, this little nebula. Yeah. Wow, what an honor to have a whole nebula named after you. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, this object this, this, is uh, uh, about 8,500 light years away. It's huge in the sky. Um, I think it's, uh, what, a couple of degrees in diameter, something like that. Um, so that's, uh, 
and it's really bright. Um, having seen it, you know, through a, a small telescope, it's just, I mean, it's spectacular to look at and, uh, uh, you know, amazing to see images of it, you know, so. Yes, this, this nebula with, with a medium or large telescope with a oxygen a filter is, is wow in the, a, yeah. in the observation. Absolutely. Um, and how is uh, how is astronomy activity down in uh, at Ch in Chile at this time? Uh, is it still uh, very active? With um, you know, you're selling telescopes. Um, uh, is the is many people still buying telescopes in Chile right now? Right now, uh, very interest in astronomy. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the, the COVID situation, uh, not uh, go to the field uh, to observation. Many people uh, um, buy telescope for your house. And uh, it's very, very... Uh, for their backyard, just like you. you. You have your telescope set up in your backyard of your, your house. Yes. Right? Yes, very, very <laughs> people in, in Chile like like that in, in your house for uh, the pandemic situation. Right. Uh, the the astro tour is, is very very uh, uh, stopped for the situation. I uh, see. Right. It'll come back. The astro tours will come back after the pandemic. Yes. Yes. Right. Is create new new system. The astro tour in. Uh, by a Zoom platform or a, a, a solar structure, uh, another uh, way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, uh, we, have, we have some observers watching from Argentina uh, tonight. And, uh, um, you know, I, I imagine you have some watching in Chile as well. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add? Anything you'd like to say to? to these people and you can speak in Spanish if you'd like. Yes. Okay, Scott, this is my, my presentation now. Okay, okay, all right. Well, thank you so much, Rodrigo. Thanks for coming back on. And we will, uh, we will switch over to uh, Molly uh, Wakeling. Uh, Molly, do you have more live views coming up now? Almost. I'm um, I'm live stacking the Crab Nebula in Hydrogen Alpha. Okay. I've, I've just got the first frame in, so you can't really see much yet. <laughs> okay. Um, I can show you, or we can come back uh, later on. Uh, we'll come back. We'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Um, that leaves uh, uh, Richard and Gary here. Um, what do you guys have to... Uh, to share. All right. Um, we got uh, the horse head. Yeah. Showing a little uh, tracking error, <clears throat> um, probably due to some flexure on the guide setup. Uh, but we went for 15 minute subs. Okay. And that's two of them. Wow. So we already got the, you can distinctly see the horse head, uh, you know, a big the section, flame. the uh, flame nebula. I was like this little part here and on attacks, like one of the hardest things to contain ever. I see like roundness coming from it, like oh, in this see. area. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, just like a little nebulosity to the star just underneath the uh, horse's head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, right almost, not quite in the middle there, but... Uh, that whole region, of course, is just filled with nebulosity, you know, and you could just keep shooting longer and longer until, you know, the Orion region is almost rec unrecognizable, you know. So I recall um, a night uh, where I was invited to go to the 48 inch Schmidt camera when they were still shooting on uh, plates and seeing a, um, seeing a glass plate with the uh, Orion region this goes back many years ago, and I, I did not know what I was looking at. I mean, it was just that 
it was that deep of a shot, you know, and uh, still on film at that time, you know, you know, glass plate film. So it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. But um, beautiful image there. Right on. Thank you. I'm going to move on to another one here and I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Back to you guys. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, why don't we stop and talk to, uh, to uh, uh, Bob here for a little bit. Uh, Bob, you, you always have a, a, a very unique aspect of, uh, of astronomy to share with us. So, and you're muted. Bob, you're muted. I, uh, I started by apologizing to you for cutting in at the beginning of the segment and talking about oh, no the problem. image behind me because I thought we were still offline. So <laughs> that's cool. That's no problem. That's all right. So, so now I'll talk about the image that's behind me. This is the observatory at the College of the Desert. And if you look up to the left of my head, I think um, you'll see me and then my wife, Stevie, uh, uh, amongst all the other people inside this observatory. This was a plane wave system that was given to the College of the Desert in Imper uh, uh, Imperial California and uh, by a person who lives in Palm Desert. It was a total gift and it is running now for the benefit of the students there. Um, it was quite, we were there for the first light on this. It was really cool. Um, as I usually say every time I have a chance to come on here is I'm not an astronomer, I'm a technologist. My job is to build tools, the software tools for people to help them do more astronomy. And also, uh, you're kind enough to put me in your little, uh, in the, the, uh, banner that you, you know, the, whatever you call it, the banner that you send out yeah. inventor of ASCOM. Well, that might be the idea. It wasn't me really, uh, the idea of a common interface between instruments and things is goes quite a ways back in computing, but I did kind of bring it into astronomy. And now there's other people who do much more work than I do. And, have brought it into the modern day. And it, in the last couple of weeks, there have been some more exciting things happening. Um, I'm not gonna bore people here with that kind of technology, it's plumbing, but uh, there's some very cool things happening with regards to being able to connect things together in a universal way. And that's kind of where I fit in. So still, still with yeah, that's uh, my thing. astronomical systems, right? So yes. Yeah. Right. So if go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. If you have a question or if somebody has a question, I'm looking at the uh, the comments. I don't see anything there, but um, it <laughs> well, the comments the idea it says go ahead and bore us. We love new stuff. Oh, well, I don't want to do that. Uh, the idea of it all is it's difficult to get things to operate with each other. And if you have a universal set of, of rules that you can use. If, if you remember the old Hayes modem, I don't know how many people are that old, but that just didn't work very well uh, for, for talking between computers and modems. But between the, I guess the LX200 protocol, quote unquote, is sort of the same type of thing. That just didn't evolve into something that really worked all that well in the long run. So a group of people, including myself, have put together a very strict set of universal rules by which you can talk as a program to a focuser or to a dome or to a camera or to a mount. And that's kind of what I do. So mm -hmm. for for the community. Right. And it's now gone beyond the Windows connectivity, which uses a feature of the Windows operating system to a network connectivity that's universal across all product, all um, platforms. So, right. and it's taking off quite nicely. There's a guy who has done so much stuff. I was just talking to him yesterday. I cannot even believe it. He came out of the woodwork about nine months ago. I talked to him and he went completely crazy and developed all this stuff to work on Unix using Python that is 
a, a set of tools for universal connectivity that that I, I don't even believe it. it. There's a lot of stuff going on right now in that whole space, and I'm I'm not prepared to give a formal talk about it. Um, give it another few months. When originally, when ASCOM was dropped into the scene in 2001 and two, it took five years before it caught. Um, Alpaca, which is the new technology, has only taken about two years and it has really caught. So it's kind of, it's rewarding. Right. Well, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, equipment and software, cameras, you know, telescopes, all this stuff has matured. And yes. it's not, it doesn't seem so foreign of a concept for someone to do networking or to um, try to connect all these disparate uh, you know, separate parts, you know, that uh, uh, before it would, it would have taken, gosh, like a programming genius such as yourself right. to actually make it happen, right? And uh, so there were very few people that were being that productive in the amateur astronomy world. Um, uh, but you've made it possible for... Uh, well, not me. I, I'm only uh, uh, one piece of the puzzle. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. But you started... <laughs> not me movement uh in the amateur astronomy world and uh, i understand you had lots of help you know but uh, well the, the 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 idea here is that if you're writing a program just let's say and I, again i want to if somebody put their hand up and shut me up if i'm going on too long but if you were writing a word processor and you needed to print and you had to print to any printer out there what are you going to do how many printers are there? And what happens to the new when a new one comes onto the market next week? And it speaks a totally other different protocol. Right. What do you do when you're in your word processor? How many printers do you have listed in there? So the idea is, which is the way word processing works, Windows has drivers. So when you buy a printer, you put in a driver, boom, and it shows up in your chooser. And there it is. You can print to that printer. Word and, and, and Notepad++, all these different programs can print to the printer without knowing anything about the details of that printer. ASCOM's the same thing, but for astronomy, just take mounts for an example. All these different mounts with bits, bytes, different, you know, X, Y, Z, Z, Y, wet spaghetti, USB, serial, whatever. But the program, SGP, Sequence Generator Pro, talks to the mount. It just knows a certain set of calls to make, and it doesn't matter what mount it is. Just like for the printer, you have a call. Here's a page. Make it come out on paper. I don't care how you do it. For the telescope, here's a place I want you to go. I don't care how you do it. Just get there and track. Right. And that's it. It's a universal interface. So that's the concept, if you can get that in in simply enough. I don't know. I don't know how to make it much simpler. Here's some commentary. Okay. And I, I think that, uh, I think Aaron Thompson, uh, has said it well, he said, Bob is a humble guy. Okay. It is more I don't think so. <laughs> programming skill to make software. You need vision. Okay. And software is more art than people give it credit. Uh, it takes vision and skill, you know, and somebody that's going to stick it through. My experience with programmers is that they always are running the program mentally in their head. Uh, they, they never quite leave it because they're always, they're always, uh, you know, improving it. And, uh, you know, so, um, you know, and I'm sure that you, you have that kind of mindset as well. So. Software is an art. It's not a science. Anybody who says software is a science doesn't know what they're talking about. Software is an art. You learn technical bits and pieces and you have a million little brushes and palettes and canvases and techniques and things. But in the end, it's an art. And anyone who's an artist, which Stevie is also, she'll tell you the same thing. And I will too. You can work on a painting forever. Right. Oh God, I got to put another little thing here or another leaf in there. It'll look better if I make this background a little darker, mm, you know, never finished, only abandoned <laughs> over and over and over. The secret to being a successful programmer is to know when to stop, right? Stop, put it out, 
and then start getting things back from people <clears throat> and cranking that into successive versions. Software is a service business. It's not a product business. Anybody who sells you software as a product, they don't know what, you know, and there's the good people always do it that way. It's here's my software. Now work with me, help me make it better for you so I can do better for you. It's a process. So right. yeah. And product so. development of any kind is kind of like that. You know? Yes, it is. It's a, it's an art, but programming is absolutely an art. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Bob, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know what I was going to say until five minutes ago, but here it is. <laughs> I'm just here as a kibitzer. I do the same thing. So, but you guys inspire me. And, you know, so what I say comes from the heart and, and uh, so and if it, that, that's, that's what you get, you know? So. Well, Scott, you opened a door for me years ago in astronomy, Jim Scotty at uh, Kitt Peak did. He yeah. opened the first door. Adam Block opened the second door uh -huh. and Scott Roberts opened the third door. Those were the three doors that early in my career that made, you know, that I jumped through those doors and here I am 22 okay. years later. Yeah, I was, I was kind of blown away because you flew your own plane into John Wayne airport. I remember. And I was just like, you flew your own plane in. <laughs> like, and wow. to Big Bear. I flew that airplane to Big Bear so many times for the old IA Triple P and SAS meetings. Yeah. Uh, I I flew it into into a Big Bear too. But yes, when I came to Mead, I flew into John Wayne and then went over to the uh, Mead factory there. That was, that awesome. was cool. I, I still remember the meeting very clearly. Me too. All right. And you were so gracious. Oh, thank you. Well, it you, was great. You know, I knew I was talking to a gentleman, you know, and I knew that well, you did great things. I did. Ditto. It was it was truly a memorable experience. And, you know, this is what makes astronomy great. I, the people I meet here, I've met here. Um, I, I'm happy to be here. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're happy to have you. <laughs> um, thank you. Gary, I, I, I think it's probably starting to get a little late over there. Did you want to uh, yeah. know some more? Yeah, time's sort of flown away tonight. It's about just coming up to 3 a.m. So Yes, it's pretty late. Yeah, all been pretty interesting. Um, what I thought we'd look at is just a bit of error correction, really, in, in images. Um, let me just find a screen share might be a good idea. Okay, there we go. Um, lots of imaging that I do is test imaging. Um, I'd love to say that I get hours and hours to do my own imaging. Most of it is with the equipment that turns up and needs some work doing on it somewhere along the line. So when we first throw it up, um, either settings are wrong, spacing's wrong, something's wrong with it, and then we end up with loads of errors. But the actual data in the background is quite good. So using this as an example, um, it's got quite a few errors in there. While it's got a lot of nice data in there for a short amount of time, it was imaged using a eight inch um, Newtonian uh, f3.2. So with it being very bright, there are lots of different areas that cropped into this area. Um, and that was partly some of my mistakes on the initial camera settings to start with and so on, which you need to do a couple of runs at this, but sometimes you don't get that luxury. Um, so if we start looking in the image, we can see we've got some reflective light uh, coming in here. Uh, there's also some reflective light down the bottom there. And that can be caused by 101 things. Um, generally, it's normally too high a gain setting on the camera. Yeah, that will start to kick that in. So all I've done on this is stack these up um, and then run them through a few processes to get them to a point where we've done a mild stretch on the image. And that helps to hold the brightness back, yeah, which is the key thing. But at this point here, it's quite a good idea to actually bring it out of uh, PixInsight and run it into Photoshop. Because to get the corrections in the background there, while you can use the clone stamp in um, PixInsight, 
it's not quite as good as the one in Photoshop. The Photoshop one is a lot easier on the tolerances and it also holds the textures where you run over something in the copy into the area. So if we flick up the Photoshop screen and bring it in, um, all I've done is remove the stars before I bring it into Photoshop. And that's going to make the correction easier because there is a complete ring of stars in this area here. Um, to do any correcting with the stars in there is more or less uh, impossible uh, to get those absolutely perfect. And all I've done here is, is use the clone stamp, uh, one of the uh, clone stamping tools mm -hmm. up in the top here, um, or a spot healing brush on this particular one, and then set it up to proximity match, yeah, or a content aware. And it's a case of trying it in each image. Both of these work slightly different, depending on the textures in the background. And then I've run through just cloning these out, basically. If you do use a content aware, it will copy the background, which is one of the key things. And then you can just run through the image. And a lot of people won't do this because to bring it out of Pixinsight, you have to convert it into a TIFF, but it's still holding all of the information there. So the TIFF file will still hold all of the relevant colors and everything else in the image. So if we actually look down here, I've run right the way through this and I've cloned all of this out. I've brought all of these out now just by literally running through with the, the clone tool. So if I wanted to do some more, I could take the tips off of these long star points here and just run through. If there are any residual satellite trails that maybe I couldn't get out in the initial image integration, then I can run through using this. Or it might be that I actually wanted to turn this image fully into a starless image. And whilst um, the star net works very, very well in PixInsight, it will leave a lot of residual stars, certainly in really dense star field areas. And you can just enlarge the tool. So if we just go into the top setting here, just change the size. And then we could go over some of these points where there are still stars there, and we can just take them straight out of the image. It works a lot better than the clone, the actual clone stamp in Photoshop. Problem with the clone stamp is the clone stamp is going to copy exact coloring from an area. Mm. So if you move very, very slightly off into the red here and you were trying to clone something in on the blue, it's going to bring red in and it's going to change the whole shape of the star area. Sure. Once these are all taken out, then we just bring it back in to Pix Insight. So just literally save the image and bring it back into Pix Insight. Then you can add your stars back in. Yeah. Um, we can also reduce the amount of stars in the image. You have to be quite careful. Using the Newtonians, you're going to get the peaks on your stars running through. So using circular structures on that doesn't really work. Yeah, so I generally I've just got to find where I put the uh, icon for that. Let me just go in and open it up. It's probably easier. So when we're using the morphological transformation, yeah, I actually use depending on how well I've got the camera aligned. So if I've got the camera aligned and the points on the stars are dead straight, like crosses towards you, yeah, then I will actually use the orthogonal structures. Yeah, if I'm like what I am here, where the stars have got diagonal lines on them, then I switch this over, yeah, and use the diagonal structure. If you use circular structure on these, yeah, you will actually put holes in the stars. So as you do further processing into the image, those holes are going to show up as donuts in the middle of the stars. But once we've actually got all of that, so if we start looking around in the image now, we've removed all of those residual problems that are in the background. And that just makes life nice and straightforward. It helps us produce an image, even though we had lots of problems in the image. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the man. final image, once it came out in Photoshop, was pretty much looking like that. So we can zoom right in. If you've got good focus on the and, and good optics on the system, you can get away with zooming right into these and you'll get some nice detail in there. Could do with a bit more color added in, but this was a quick thing for tonight. So um, I'd probably play around a little bit more with this.
but you could shrink these lines down a little bit more if you wanted. It's totally down to you. Each person is different on what they like to see in an image. Right. I've seen people add uh, diffraction spikes on refractor images because they just love that diffraction spike look, you know. So. Yeah, the, 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 there are some um, processes that you can add them in, uh, some actions that add them in. I think Astronomy Tools does that uh, in Photoshop. But they're generally quite short, so they, they end up looking like a church cross on the style. Okay. <laughs> um, and when you actually look at them, they, they really look like they're more hanging um uh in the sky so it, it depends on what what your um what your outlook is on it uh yeah. every person is different a lot of people i've seen have taken the um the secondary veins off and put curves in them to actually reduce them out on newtonian so if you curve mm -hmm. the veins there you know that, oh, that right. would just reduce them out and it, it makes it easier to subtract them out in initial stacking right Excellent. Well, gosh, uh, Gary, thank you so much for coming back on today. Hope you're no hope you had a great holiday season. I don't think I've talked to you since. No, uh, no, we've both been busy, I think. Yeah. So, but uh, I hope that that was all good. And, uh, you know, we know that, um, as you mentioned earlier, that uh, the UK is on complete lockdown right now. So that's, uh, that is uh, tough, uh, you know, on everyone there, but, um, Hopefully it, it, it's all over soon. So, yeah, yeah. And it's, I think it's the same everywhere. Everywhere is going to have to change uh, uh, around these things and they're, they're going to put strains and stresses on uh, people in different areas. And that's what's good about this sort of thing. It's bringing all of these different things out to people. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, you know, people are having a bit of fun. They're enjoying what everybody's doing and, and getting some different ideas on different things. Yeah, great. Gary, thank you, man. That's awesome. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've had um, we've had two new people join us. Um, I know Molly is back there, busy tracking and stacking the Crab Nebula. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Carlos is brand new to this program. Uh, he was on earlier today, um, and uh, he is in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, uh, and he's just he's relatively new to astronomy outreach, but is now developing a, a pretty big following. Um, and uh, he he has developed a way that has been city approved. OK, um, uh, for people to observe through telescopes. And so he's giving uh, star parties. He's doing astronomy outreach at a Safeway parking lot and. Um, and he's got an incredible story, uh, so I'll let I'll let Carlos tell it. He's he's a he's an inspiration, and um, I'm really glad that you decided to come on tonight, Carlos. Thanks. Absolutely. Let me know. If, okay, you can hear me. Good. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, thanks for having me on. I I feel so small joining, um, you know, legends in this <laughs> in this um, in this hobby i'd say it's more than a hobby honestly um it's more like a lifestyle for most of us it is a lifestyle. but um, um yeah so hey everyone um uh, my name's carlos i'll try to briefly go through this last time i was on for quite a while <laughs> um but uh i was in the military for um for nine years and i got injured I crushed my shoulder inside of an aircraft and uh, I was put on painkillers. Um, after six years, I became addicted to those painkillers um, and went through a divorce and became homeless. So I was homeless for about a year and a half and um, I had lost myself. I lost my morals. I lost everything that meant something to me, my family and all that. So went through a pretty rough time um, and someone found me um, behind a Safeway parking lot where I was staying in literally in the bushes and um, brought me to the, re the, to the VA rehab center. Um, and that's when I made the decision to either continue to use and um, not change my life and die basically or 
to change my life and, um, you know, start a new path. So I went into rehab. It was awesome. Absolutely wonderful program that the VA has and, uh, and got clean. And, you know, I got out, met my girlfriend. I still hadn't quite found myself yet. Um, this was about a year later. And one day, you know, I was never into astronomy before, but one day I went and bought a Walmart telescope. Um, so that, you know, of course, a terrible decision, <laughs> but I went into my backyard one day, I stumbled across the brightest thing I could find, which was Jupiter. And literally the, the views that that little Tasco telescope brought in for my, you know, newbie eyes blew my mind so much. Um, I, I loved every second of it, tracking, focusing, trying to stop the dang thing from vibrating and wiggling around. Um, it was a pain in the butt, but that night I came inside, I realized I did not have any stress, anxiety, any of my PTSD symptoms that I usually have every day. Um, and, you know, I was ecstatic. I wanted to share it with as many people as I, as I could. Um, so we bought an eight inch Dobsonian, brought it to the Safeway parking lot, a different Safeway, but, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, just let anyone come look, come look at the moon and Saturn and Jupiter while they were up. Um, and it was a hit. We have, we don't, we, at the time, we didn't have any astronomy programs on the east side of Tucson. The west side and Star Arizona had their stuff, but we didn't have anything over here. And so I, I honestly, I reached out to Dean and he, he gave us our first sponsored full telescope package in Evolution 8. And we we're so grateful to him. But, um, but yeah, he helped us bring um, astronomy to the east side and um, ever since we've been doing star parties every month. Um, and because I was homeless, I had, you know, an interaction with that community and I really cared for them, um, because they're just normal people. Um, it could be anyone. And, uh, and so we, me, my girlfriend and I continued to volunteer at nonprofits full time. And then we decided why not bring astronomy and charity work together. So we created a nonprofit last year in June called Reach for the Stars. Um, now we have about 16 telescopes right now. Most of them were donated by the community and um, by random people around who believe in what we're doing. Um, and we, uh, it's all ran out of our home. Our home is stacked with shelving um, telescopes and fun equipment. <laughs> um, nothing too crazy, but, you know, we make do with what we get. Um, we have about 10 Mead ETX 60s, <laughs> wow. a bunch of little guys. But I use those to train people. I use those to, um, to train people. Anyways, the, the, the um, foundation or this nonprofit that we started, we do a star party every month. It's one of our main programs. We also feed anyone in need out of our home. And then we also help the homeless with backpacks filled with a bunch of cool stuff, essential items. Um, yeah, so we, when COVID struck, that's when we were, we were just getting started and we we're like, the star party program is so important to us. We want it, you know, for me, it helps with mental health, um, issues as well as being a hobby it gives me quality family time. We just, we wanted other people to have that and to have something to look forward to. So, um, so we came up with a way to continue to, to have the star parties every month with city approval. Um, basically, we have a list of items that we follow, like everyone wears a mask, families stay in groups together with their family, 10 feet from the next family in line, um, normal precautions like that. But as well, um, we did some searching and wanted to find some some type of plexiglass sheets. So we bought these, they're picture frame plexiglass sheets, four by six from Amazon. They come with dual sided 
um, cellophane that you can peel off. And when you peel it off, it's the plexiglass is crystal clear. I can put that in front of the camera and you wouldn't even tell the difference. It's crystal clear um, and it doesn't impede the viewing for the telescope at all, which is really cool. And it allows children, normal people to get right up to the telescope, not touch anything. And we do right on one side eyeball, the other side scope. Um, so they know not to, uh, you know, mix the two and, and all that. Um, and so that's allowed us to continue along with the list of other th small things we do, but this was the main one. And, um, and they're really, you know, they're not that expensive. It's 20 bucks for, for um, or no, $14 for 20 of them. You can cut them in half if you need to. You don't need to, to um, glue a popsicle stick onto it. I just do it for the kids. Um, it helps them not keep their sticky fingers off the, off the clear part. So, so yeah, it's really, um, it's been a, it's been awesome. It's been working. We've been having star parties every single month. Our next one is January 30th and, um, yeah, all the programs are completely free and I just love advocating for this awesome, um, this awesome hobby. I love all the people in it, everyone who does what they do everyone who talks online, all of you who are here watching this, all of you who are the presenters, you guys are all uh, my heroes and I hope to be um, on your level someday. And uh, I just wanna share the beauty, the wonder, the fascination and the happiness that we get, the reward that we get with every single person that we can, so. Yeah, that is awesome, that is awesome. Uh, earlier today, you were talking about how many meals you've already supplied. I think you said like something 14,000 uh, meals. Last you... month was, was 14,000, yeah. Last month? Yeah, last month. Last month. <laughs> yeah, we, every, each month is 13 or 14,000 meals out yeah. of our garage. <laughs> it's crazy. That is amazing. Well, I know that you're, you must be having a huge effect on people uh, especially homeless. I'm, I'm sure many of them think that uh, no one cares for them or, uh, you know, that no one takes the time to inspire them. You're doing both. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, uh, you keep that up. Uh, they're going to erect a statue to you in, in the middle of Tucson. So <laughs> um, I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. And, and I, you know, to be honest, being, I used to be ashamed to talk about the addiction, but it, it can happen to anyone. I wasn't abusing them. I was just taking the prescription as normal. And, um, and yeah, so all the, the homeless people, they're just, they're just normal people who fell on hard times. I was spit on before and it's not a good feeling. So we want to, we want to, we want to bring star parties to them too, to the homeless parks, mm -hmm. um, to show them we've done it twice so far and the reactions we get when we show them what's been lying above them the whole time that they're out on the street at night is incredible you know most tear up it's a it's a really good great experience so yeah a comment here uh, no shame in telling your story it is what makes you 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 know and thank uh, you yeah uh, there are other people i'm watching this program right now that have uh uh, suffered the same problems and uh, you know you're showing them that there's a way out um, and that you can turn your you know your life around to be the kind of life you want it to be and and uh, it takes takes hard work but uh, you know uh, it's just I've been on a high all day since uh, uh, you've uh, you came on our program earlier and I was like wow I, I, I was I was praying that you would actually come on this show tonight and, and tell it again. So thank you so much. And you are welcome anytime, you know. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. I know that we have uh, uh, very iconic astronomers on this program, uh, but um, you know, you're, you are an inspiration to anyone. And uh, thank you, that's great. Thank Thanks you. guys. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Carlos, take care. You have a wonderful evening. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, let's go to, let's check back in with Molly because I checked in with her earlier 
and she uh, said, I only have one sub at this time, so. Uh, yeah, it looks like I have enough to, to show here. So um, okay. let, me, uh, let me zoom this in a bit. Uh, let's see, and change the target name here. <laughs> and, yeah. Nebula. How many scopes are you running out the backyard right now? <laughs> Three. <laughs> um, hang on just a second. Let's do this. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, crab nebula. Uh, this is a supernova remnant up in, what's it in? Taurus. I should know this. Ah. Anyway, supernova remnant. And um, this is a hydrogen alpha image of it. And it, it almost looks kind of like a brain to me with all the, the lines and the filaments and stuff like that. And it's, it's, uh, it's kind of just a fuzzy thing if you look at it visually, but especially when you take it in narrow band. So hydrogen and oxygen and sulfur, it really just pops out from the background. It's got this, uh, so the, the progenitor star, the original star that um, went supernova, the core of it became a neutron star, and that neutron star became a pulsar, uh, which is a rapidly spinning neutron star that, that emits a lot of energy. And so that's why we can still see this remnant today is because the energy from this pulsar is, is lighting it up like a candle and or like something much brighter than a candle, <laughs> like a spotlight. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's a really fascinating object because the, the pulsar is actually spinning at a rate that if you have a, like some people are actually able to see the rapid blinking of it. I think it's like, I think the, the rotation time's like 30 milliseconds or something like that. Really? And visually, some people have, go ahead. They visually see it. I, there's been a few reports of some people who've been able to see the pulsar blinking as, it's, as it spins around. It's only been a few. Mm -hmm. um, who uh, whose you know eye frame rate is particularly fast or something like that, but um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating object and uh, it continues to be studied now. And there's some there's an incredible Hubble image of it as well. Uh, so this is just uh, a stack of five minute frames. It's actually only three frames because uh, I was having some trouble getting the guiding to to get rolling. Um, but yeah, it just pops right out. You know, the, the Crab Nebula is constantly studied. Um, you know, the, the Hubble did uh, uh, some, um, a sonification uh, scan or something like that on, on it recently. You can see that on, uh, um, on uh, I think it's on NASA's website. It says NASA shares sonification video of the Crab Nebula and it's amazing. Uh, that's when they like like assign a sound to different brightnesses and colors and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yes. And um, you know, there's uh, there was an amateur astronomer who did a ten year time lapse of the oh yeah, uh, I've seen nebula, and that's 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 really amazing. You know, yeah, so it's still expanding, and this supernova went off like what a thousand something years ago, and it's still expanding. Right. Yeah. So it's just a. Uh, it's an amazing object. I love looking at it as well, and I love seeing astrophotographs of it. So um, we'll come back to you uh, if you got more data uh, towards the end of this. Sure. Um, and right now we'll switch to uh, Jason. Jason, thank you for coming on the program. Uh, uh, you know, you have uh, you've been blowing people away with your images. I, earlier today, you know, we had a product development meeting. And um, we started talking more about the AR series of telescopes. Uh, and I use your images to show um, uh, the people who actually build uh, those telescopes, what you've been doing with them. And uh, uh, they were utterly stunned, you know, so it's- That's just, great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I wish you could have been in the, in the meeting. It was pretty cool. So- Yeah, were, uh, and in my signature model. So good, you know, <laughs> so very cool. Um, yeah, so I, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed um, Carlos's talk, and that, that was that was pretty, yeah, pretty okay. good story. Um, I love you know hearing that people, you know, turning it around like that. It's a great story. Me too. I I'm uh, 
I've actually secretly, I have had a secret project in the form of a book. I've never written a book before. Uh, I've written a chapter uh, with ASP that I put out a book on astronomy outreach, and I've done some forwards and stuff like that. Uh, but um, this book that I'm putting together is uh, about uh, how astronomy changes people's lives. And uh, uh, so I've, I've asked him to write a chapter, and I, I hope he does. You know, so that would be yeah. I, I think you you find that most people that are into it have um, you know a story about how you know it filled a void that that was there. Um, yeah. You know, for some people, it's a, you know a, a bigger deal than others, but um, definitely you know it it draws people in. Um, cause I think a lot of a lot of people find perspective in it, you know, um, you know, the cosmic perspective mm -hmm. uh, kind of reflects back into their own life. So yeah, yeah, that's a great story, that. but okay. I, um, I don't, I, I haven't had any good weather to be imaging. So I just thought maybe I'd take a tour of some of the images I've been shooting lately and um, we love to see share them. those. I'll share my desktop here. Um, and also, I get, you know, I always uh, get in this meeting, but I never really introduce myself because, of, you know, I've been in here a few times, but I guess for any, yeah, for any newcomers, um, you yourself. know, I'm a, what's that? I said, it'd probably be a good idea to reintroduce yeah. yourself. Like, I can start off by, I mean, uh, uh, Jason's uh, popular handle is called the Vast Reaches. Uh, and um, he is someone that, you, know, you haven't been in astrophotography very long, have you? Um, How many years? I got a telescope in 2013. So, I mean, I've been in, you know, probably eight years now. So, okay. Okay. Um, you know, I originally bought a telescope thinking I was going to do visual astronomy and I had an eyepiece in that thing for maybe three sessions and then there was a camera on it ever since then. I never took it off. But, um, yeah, I mean, I started out slowly and I never, um, I never committed to it at least uh, initially, um, it took me a, a few years to, to kind of decide it was something I wanted to pursue yeah. seriously. And then, yeah, I would say around probably 2015, I kind of got, got rolling with it and got serious and, and kind of picked up steam with it. But yeah, so I started, you know, sharing stuff around online and, um, you know, kind of building a following. There's, there's really a, a large appetite for um, space images. Um, and again, I think, you know, it connects with people. Um, everybody seems to connect to something different. Some people love the deep space stuff. Some people, you know, just love moon photography or, or uh, solar photography or planets and stuff like that. So um, I'm kind of a jack of all trade, master of none kind of, <laughs> kind of person. I, I try to experiment with as much as I can. And, and, uh, um, Jack of all trades. But yeah, I mean, so this to anybody watching, this is my Instagram page where I have, you know, probably the biggest, well, it is the biggest following I have, but um, so you can find me uh, under my handle, which is the vast reaches, all one word like that. Um, so I'll pull up some images here. These are some recent ones I've been working on. Um, so I've got a couple um, nightscape type pictures, um, something I like to do. Um, and what I like about nightscape photography is you can you can do it uh, when the can you see my screen is it sharing yeah, okay see. Um, you know you can kind of do it even if the weather's uh, iffy for for astronomy you can see you know light clouds moving through the frame but you know you get yourself in some nice spots and you can you can pull off some pretty interesting images that way so this is um, the uh, first quarter moon setting um, in northern Michigan over um, the Mackinac Bridge, which connects the upper and lower peninsula of Michigan. So um, the moon, the moon's here, Saturn is a little bit um, hidden by the haze, and then this is uh, the bright Jupiter. Um, and this is a historic location um, in the War of 1812. This was uh, a place where the British had invaded uh, this island. It's wow. so Mac Mackinac Island out in the out in Lake Huron, but it's a kind of a strategic strong point um, 
you know, in early, early times when they were really understand fur trading in the area and stuff like that. So I didn't understand what that was in the, the foreground there, but it's a cannon. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, this is a historical mar marker. This is called British landing. That's where the British landed on this shore and, and um, invaded the island and, and uh, took the, took the fort that's on the high point of the island. So they marched with cannons across the, uh, the wilderness for two miles, <laughs> but um, they actually snuck through in the dead of night and surrounded the fort. And that fort was surrendered without loss of life on either side. So wow. it was an American, American outpost fort there. And this is a um, similar location, just to, um, kind of around the bend from that last one. And this is looking towards the east over Lake Huron. A uh, different night, but this is Mars rising out of the haze. And this was taken back when the California wildfires were raging. And we'd get these, um, even in Michigan, we'd get these nights where the, the haze just moved in. And um, the cool thing about it is it, it put this color I've never seen before on the horizon line. Mm -hmm. It's just this murky kind of kind of orange brown color. It is beautiful though. It's a very nice composition. And so this is the Little Dumbbell Nebula. It's Messier 76. And um, it's framed here, interestingly, with a with a red giant star. So this, when I posted this one, I kind of told a little story about it. But this is, um, you know, kind of a look into the fate of our sun. Because we've got this, this red giant shining there. Mm -hmm. And then you know, the, the next stage of evolution is into a planetary nebula where it sheds its atmosphere and, you know, internally illuminates the nebula. So that's what we see here in the, in the little dumbbell. That is an amazing shot of the little dumbbell nebula. Yeah. yeah I didn't even know that it had that, that hydrogen region on the, on the bottom, right? Kind of on both yeah. It's sides. got these little wings that come yeah, out of either I side. Know the thing. <laughs> yeah. The, the, wow. Those are dim, but yeah, they're, um, they're wow. there. Could you zoom in on the on the little dumbbell? Closer? Yeah, actually, this this image here was a look at that. Here's a holy catfish. Yeah, I've never seen it like that before. Wow. You know that this one is a huge challenge to make look right because when when you oh. zoom in, there's so much going on there that it just it it looks messy, you know, but. Um, yeah, there's just layers of hydrogen and, and oxygen. You know, the, the uh, hydrogen illuminates or glows red, and then the, the oxygen is the blue blue colors. I'll, I'll be honest. To me, it looks like a tardy grade under a microscope. You got yeah. your eyes off to the left, and right, like yeah. its body kind of scrunched up a little bit with its legs. Oh my goodness, those do look like eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> I think you've uh, changed what it's called. I, I don't oh, think no. it's called a dumbbell anymore. Yeah, the unfortunate thing about the names of these objects is they don't change, right? I mean, they were named at a time when people were just looking at them visually. So maybe one part yeah. of it looked like something. And now you see this image where it's I've got all this extended of, nebulosity and it doesn't look anything like. I've seen a lot of astrophotographs of this. I've never seen it like this before. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, I think I put about 30 hours into this total um just probably just over 12 hours in hydrogen and oxygen and then uh rgb for the coloration of the stars mm -hmm. over how much clock time did it take you to um acquire all the data for that how many days weeks months whatever yeah it's it's months because i generally what i do is i sequence up my targets for the night and I'll shoot them when they're in, you know, the best position um, during the night. So I might shoot, you know, probably maximum of, you know, four or five hours on a target in a night. So that, that right there means it's, it was taken over. I mean, even if I got that much time every, every session, I was taking over, you know, six, seven nights. And then, um, you know, those are spaced out, obviously, right? You know, to avoid the moon and, and things like that. So, yeah, definitely an image like this will take me a couple months to, to complete. 
the, it's fantastic. The, totally thanks. fantastic. Thanks. But the, uh, you know, capturing it was one thing and then getting around to processing it, it takes me a whole nother few months. So right. I think I shot this one in early, uh, early last year, I think in, in the spring. Beautiful. I didn't mean to diminish the art in that. I was just curious on the acquisition side. No, no. I mean, it's that's, that's the, the art is where it is. You know, I mean, that's just the unbelievable. Technical. Yeah. I'm waiting for a, uh, a um, you know, a book, an oversized book of, uh, from the that bathroom. Like is, that I coffee keep table. <laughs> And so this is um, this is Jupiter in ultraviolet, which is again an uncommon uh, way to look at it. But I uh, got an ultraviolet filter last year to try to shoot uh, Venus with, and I, I, I've shown on this on this uh, on this star party. I've shown those pictures of Venus I got with that filter because you can start to see the cloud details in yeah. the planet um so i thought well why not just try to shoot jupiter with it so this is what jupiter looks in ultraviolet interesting thing i thought in this image is how dark the storms look and especially yeah. the great red spot um emits almost no ultraviolet which is interesting inky inky black and then this is that ultraviolet image layered in with an R rgb image so this just extends the the range of the visual spectrum into the to the ultraviolet so it looks perfect mm -hmm. are we looking at the shadow of a moon the dark spot yeah there? this is ganymede here uh -huh. if you can see my mouse and then the shadows there that's what Thanks. i thought yeah the detail doesn't come through in ultraviolet uh, as much as the other channels so that the channel is kind of murky <laughs> Beatrice Hines is asking, Jason, how did you learn to process like that all by yourself? Or did you, did you, uh, follow, um, some classes, courses? I never took any courses. I, um, you know, initially I spent a lot of time on the cloudy nights forum and just kind of, well, uh, grab tutorials there. I could find, um, Mm -hmm. either video tutorials or, or text-based tutorials and, and uh, just kind of learn that way. And then, you know, once I got to a certain point, and I think everybody, you know, that, that gets into processing gets to the point where um, you start to see the end goal at the beginning of the process and you, you know, start figuring out the steps it takes to get there and you kind of build your own workflow and, and uh, techniques. So that's mm -hmm. kind of been the progression for me. Someone is wanting to know what size scopes you're using. I know you have several. Um, yeah, so this was the, this one, the little dumbbell was taken with my eight inch SCT. It's an Edge HD eight inch. And then this uh, Jupiter is taken with a 12 inch Newtonian. Awesome. And I just have a bunch of them of the conjunction. I haven't been on this since we had the conjunction. So this was... Okay. Uh, I think this was December 7th. So this is when they were approaching uh, Jupiter and Saturn there um, in, the, the in the sunset. Yeah. See the moons of Jupiter strung out there. Uh -huh. And these are just 100% crops of those, of this image. Just, this is taken with the 600 millimeter camera lens. So you can just barely begin to make out the detail in, in the Saturn rings and uh, the planet of Jupiter. And this is kind of uh, the full, more full frame of that. And then this was the night before the conjunction, the uh, 20th of December. This was taken with the 12 inch Newtonian again. Um, so I got some, you know, decent detail of the planet Saturn with the rings and, um, you know, some moons speckled around here, if you can see them. A lot of dust on my computer screen, so I can't run it. But um, then Jupiter also. Um, interesting thing is that there's a ton of pictures I saw online of this this night, and 
kind of catches you off guard initially because it looks like Jupiter's got five Galilean moons here, but this star, this this what looks like a moon here is actually a background star that's shining about the, about the same brightness as the moons and, and right in line in that plane. That's pretty. And this this image just shows my uh, workspace and picks insight um, of the conjunction and shows this right here is the frame of my camera. And you can see how close <laughs> these were to falling off the edge. So I had to go back and take uh, a mosaic to get that image I just showed where I took several images and this down in the bottom are the different sets I took to get the moons uh, of Saturn moons of Jupiter, and I had to do that in two separate frames. And then I did one for the overall scene. And then I did these close-up shots or cropped shots to get the, the planets in detail. Mm -hmm. That just shows kind of how that image came together. And Jupiter was so much brighter than Saturn. Yeah, yeah. This So this gives you an idea of the relative brightness between them, too. This was just a single shot. And then during that session uh, from my backyard, I, I found that these planets lined up perfectly over top. Well, I moved around quite a bit to, to get it to line up over the tree. And then I took um, a shot with my camera lens um, of the tree in focus and then the planets in focus. And then I overlaid that close up image I shot with a 12 inch Newtonian to get the detail in there. So. Jason, I'll have to say, this looks like, you know, like one of those metaphysical uh, <laughs> compositions. I mean, it's just so incredible. Well, so this was coming up on Christmas, right? So I, <laughs> at least in this, in this wide shot, I, I, I rendered in these star spikes to make it look like a tree topper, but yeah, um, those obviously cool. aren't cool. there. Um, so I've got a few shots of that, you know, this is without the, the rendering, but mm -hmm. Um, this is with the, all those shots layered on top of each other and then just some close-ups here. So, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so at full scale, I mean, this, it's a huge image because of the way I, I layered it in there, but right. these are just the, uh, the low-resolution res files. But. And then um, since that was the only clear span I had for the whole conjunction, then I packed up my camera and I drove over to the park and got a shot of the conjunction as it was setting over the lake. So that's this shot. A nice shot. I had two hours of clear sky and I took full advantage. Mm -hmm. That is just gorgeous. Yeah, thanks. That, what I really like about this is the iced lake and the, the uh, reflection of the planets in the, in the lake. Oh, yeah. It makes the image, that's for sure. And then uh, this is the Iris Nebula shot with a uh, Celestron Rasa telescope and a ASI 533MC camera. Wow. So I was able to get from my light polluted location uh, tons of background signal on that. Hmm. Way more than I've ever been able to pull out. So that's the advantage of shooting at F2. Right. Got um, you know, quite a bit of detail down into the core too. Yeah. Tiny little stars. So then this is one I'm working on right now. This was shot with the AR-152. It was obviously a starless image, but this is a. Uh, it's called Wolf uh, WR-134. It's a Wolf Rayet star, and. Um, I'm putting on my glasses for this one. The halo uh, surrounding it, but. This is just a work in progress. I figured I'd share it since it was on my other desktop. This is just in hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah, it looks like it looks dangerous or something. It's amazing. Yeah, actually, let me flip this over. This looks like a. I think it looks like a dolphin right here. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> you can almost see it as a as an eye as well and with the top part being like the eyelid and then you can kind of see like the iris and like kind of a pupil. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this so this this little fringing that goes all the way around here, which I'm going to work to accentuate, is actually part of that nebula that's shed out by that star in the middle. Huh. Other um, Wolf Rayet nebulae, uh, well, the most popular or famous one is the Crescent Nebula, uh -huh. which is the same same type. But I think that one's significantly younger than this one. This one's a lot more diffuse. And, uh, especially the, this section out here is just almost faded to oblivion. Incredible. I love seeing new stuff like that too, you know. Yeah, that, that, uh, that scope works well in narrow band, I'm not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. This is um, a lot less integration than I normally put into images too with my SCT. And then this is the, uh, this is the sun shot that a lot of people liked. <laughs> this is, yeah. me too. I, I call it a stylized version because I, I way, way, uh, I went super deep into the, in the processing of this one, but, um, you know, I was able to extract a, just a ton of contrast and, you know, details in the chromosphere. Um, so this is, yeah, this is the solar with the AR-152 also. Is that with like a, like a quark? Yeah, it's a Daystar quark on the back in a ASI-174 mono camera. That's good to know because I wasn't sure um, how the performance between like a quark and like uh, having an actual solar telescope like a LUNT would be but um this looks pretty promising <laughs> yeah well no so i've used both and i i definitely have my opinions on them um you know this system with the with the ar-152 and the quark i get loads of detail but i get really low contrast and to get the contrast to reveal itself i really need to push the image really hard um, and that's especially true for prominences you know these these uh, wisps of chromosphere that hang over the, the limb of the sun with a dedicated solar scope like a LUNT. I've used this uh, 60 millimeter LUNT um, pressure tune and that provides loads of contrast um, but it's hard to get the same level of detail and that may be just you know due to aperture but yeah um, you know the good thing about the AR-152 is you get a lot of aperture for the for the for the money and um, the quark, you know, adding the quark onto that telescope puts you about in the same price class as, you know, getting a, a say a lunt 60 millimeter. Um, so it's, I guess it really kind of depends on what you're going after if you are um, <clears throat> wanting to image or time lapse prominences, um, you know, it might make you lean towards the lunt, whereas, uh, you know, if you want chromosphere details, I think this this system has served me well, and I really like uh, well, like using it. Get you in really close. The uh, I get maybe with the lunt you could get a full disc image. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, um, this is my full field of view. So I there's right. if I have to mosaic this out to get the whole disc, I have to take like I've done it before. I think. I think I did six panels up and three panels over, so 18, 20 panels maybe to get the whole thing. Yeah. It's I've just gotten, a lot of work. I've gotten full disk with like an APS-C or four thirds chip on a LUNT uh, 80 before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got the full disk with the same camera on the LUNT 60 that, that made a photo, focal length, so. So there's, there's lots of questions being asked and comments. Um, let's see. Uh, people just blown away uh, saying, Jason, that's awesome. Uh, Clear Light 58 says, I either need to get a new camera or give up. His stuff is amazing. <laughs> um, uh, Andrew Corkill, I'm not sure I have the patience to learn and do that processing. It does, it does take a lot of dedication and patience. Um, people just blown away. Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, Richard Lighthill, um, 
He says, with this AR-127, it's a 152 that you have. Um, yeah. Does he still use a solar filter in addition to the cork? Yeah, so what I what I do or the setup that I use is I, I have a um, the AR-152 as a telescope, obviously, not cork. Um, Daystar, the recommendation from Daystar is um, it's usable without a front mounted energy rejection filter up to six inches of aperture. So I'm at that limit, um, mm -hmm. which initially was pretty concerning to me to put you know, expensive equipment at the back end of this telescope. Um, so what they do recommend you do is to reject energy back out of the scope is to use a, a dielectric uh, UVIR cut filter and then a dielectric filter will reflect energy back out the front of the scope. So all the infrared and all the ultraviolet gets reflected back out the, the front of the telescope. And then behind that, I have a quark um, to handle the rest of the, you know, the rest of the filtering and then the camera behind that. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I want to make sure is to get that any piece of glass you put at the back of the telescope is potentially subject to heat. So I wanted to get that. UVIR cut filter as far forward as I could, so I, I've got um, I've got it placed probably six inches in front of the quark, um, maybe a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, to really do that filtering um, before the light cone reduces enough to to heat heat it up. And you're not you don't think that you're cutting off any of the light cone coming in down to to the tube. You got the large enough of a filter, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, the, the way the quark works is the, the front aperture of the quark is maybe a centimeter okay. big. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've, I've, you know, I've placed it in a few different positions. I haven't seen any light fall off. Okay. But it's definitely, I mean, I guess the message is you want to be real careful with the solar telescope, especially one like the quark setup where you're configuring it yourself. You Definitely want to be confident in it before you use it. Um, and it's one thing to put equipment like cameras back there, but it's another thing to put your eyeball back behind there. So anybody who's thinking about it, do your research and uh, make sure you're following all the recommendations before you mm -hmm. right. That's use right. a setup like that. Totally agree. I've seen people also make mistakes of leaving uh, finders on and uh, not covering them and you know, uh, you can yep. catch your hair on fire, <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah, I've done, I've done, I've done things. I'm not gonna lie. I think any anybody who's done solar um, yeah. has, uh, has an oopsie every once in a while, and um, yeah, I've definitely had an oopsie. But yeah, I was at I was uh, during the '91 eclipse. Uh, I was on Mauna Kea uh, filming the eclipse with the. Uh, uh, there's a science program called Nova on PBS, and so I was part of that crew, and uh, and so they were showing that the the Keck telescope had not yet been completed, okay, but they had a few mirror segments inside of it, and uh, I guess in all their excitement uh, during the day, because the governor was up there and everything, they left the dome open, okay, and when I, I guess they went off and had lunch or something. Anyways, the sun. The sun comes, okay, and bounces off those mirrors and actually starts to smoke the inside of that dome, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I can't imagine what the energy of that was. Yeah, you know? yeah. But um, anyhow. Yeah, it's no I joke. Went... My finder scope doesn't have crosshairs in it anymore. <laughs> 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 Whoops. <laughs> I went up to New Mexico skies to visit Mike Rice, and he showed me a camera that had been melted all the way through to the back by having left the telescope just randomly pointed at the sky and the sun came up and just burnt the whole thing all the way out the back. It's quite an artifact. I'm always so afraid of that happening like when I sleep in at a star party because occasionally there'll be a fault in like uh, like the plate solver that I use for sequence generator pro. And so the sequence will freeze and it won't park the telescope in the, in, at the end of the night. 
So I'm always worried that one of these days <laughs> it's going to be pointing south when the sun when the sun goes by <laughs> before I wake up and catch it. I hope like hell you're not using pinpoint with SGP. That no, I hope I'm that seeing, didn't freeze. No, I, I it tends to happen more often with ASTAP. Uh, I use ASTAP on one instance of it and plate solve. I have two instances running on one computer controlling two different mounts. I discovered you can't use the same plate solver for two different rigs because it will steal from the other one if they happen to go at, at approximately the same time. <laughs> so I use ASTAP for one and plate solve two for the other. And ASTAP tends to have weird like uh, faults and like uh, so weird errors and stuff where it, the sequence won't continue until you hit okay. So <laughs> that's a relief. Yeah, it's I I haven't really figured out what causes the error. Um, yeah, I don't really know. I'm just like one of these days. <laughs> it's probably, I need to figure that out. So it looks like uh, Richard has a uh, stack of the uh, rosette. Is that right? Ooh. Yeah, I'm, I'm done here. So. It's not. Jason, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. you blew everybody awesome. away. Thanks you always, always do. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 45 minutes on the rosette uh, before we hit the meridian. Okay. So you can start to see some of the structure uh, on the inside, those nodules and stuff, where all that dark nebulosity is. Rosette's I'm, beautiful. I'm getting used to the uh, larger sensor. I think the uh, the dirty word flats are going to have to start getting used around here. I don't know what they are entirely. I mean, I know what they are, but I've never done them yet. So not that by, by the way, the middle seems to be uh, brighter than the outside. I think I'm going to have to start doing some flats here sometime soon. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to show that. And uh, I think we got a little clouds coming in by the signal to noise on the guiding. But uh, it's been a good night. All right. Yeah, you thought you were going to get clouded out entirely. I I didn't expect it to be this good tonight. The weather didn't say it was going to be this good tonight. So I'm happy. That's awesome. Richard, where are you? Annapolis, Maryland. Hmm, good. Where Right on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, surrounded on three sides. Uh, I have to run dew heaters all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Molly, you have, um, you have another image you're working on there? <laughs> uh, well, I continued on, on the crab to see if we can get some better uh, okay. contrast. So um, let me switch screens here. There we go. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I've got 10 frames here now, so 50 minutes of data. And you can see now that the, the background's starting to get darker and the crab's starting to get brighter. It helps that we've, you know, we're further past sunset now and it's getting higher in the sky. Um, but yeah, you can start to see a little more detail there. Um, let me zoom in. I don't know how well this will yeah. come through. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, it is nice. But yeah, so yeah, you can see a lot of some of the, the larger uh, structure here and a lot of the smaller ones. And I, I think the the um, pulsar is is pretty much exactly in the middle of, you know, kind of where you would expect it to be. Um, but we can't we can't see it here. I think I think it's too dim to see it with like amateur scopes, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's like a three quarter uh, face view of Darth Vader, you know. Oh. It does. It kind of does, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. It does. I'm starting to see things more and more into nebulosity anymore. <laughs> Maybe I need to go get mentally checked. I don't know. But... It's getting on in the evening, you know? <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a trait of astronomers to see shapes and stuff in space. So we're always naming things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always some new nebula and I'm like, and I'll, I'll have a relatively young or newer amateur astronomers say, did you see the such and such nebula or and I'm like, what, you know, I didn't even know it existed. So, um, but uh, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and there's, there's some nebula that have been discovered like in the last decade or two. That's right. Uh, photographically with, with the newer equipment and now that CMOS cameras are on the scene, we might see some more as well. Um, just because am like amateurs like us who can just take data wherever we want to in the sky and kind of troll through it. Um, you know, we have more time to do those kinds of things than the professional telescopes do. Oh, sure. So, um, Probably more yeah, of those types of deliveries to come. Yeah, I, I often would, after spending that time on Mauna Kea for, I was there for four days and three nights and and I got, that was, that was really my first dose of what professional astronomy was like, you know, at, at you know, Mauna Kea, certainly at that time, and it still is a place where, uh, you know, people, you know, fight to get time on those tel telescopes. Yeah. It's not, it's not the kumbaya experience of what amateur astronomy is. These people, you know, they, they are, they, they are, um, uh, you know, fighting for, uh, the same science dollars, you know, for their grants, uh, they are fighting for time on an instrument, you know, to, to make it all is super competitive. I mean, yeah. you're super competitive and, and they, <laughs> You know, they, um, uh, they're not always, um, you know, standing around, uh, uh, thinking about how wonderful it is, you know, uh, <laughs> I know after the fact they do, but, but, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a struggle in there and, uh, and maybe that's the way science should be, um, uh, you know, for people to try their best at all times and, and, uh, you know, giving the greatest possible effort that they can, you know, and that, that makes it a little tough uh, if you're in that environment. But I, I was going up the elevator to get oxygen uh, <laughs> and uh, there were, I was surrounded by uh, a group of um, astronomers from, from uh, France and another group of astronomers and they're all yelling and screaming at each other as we're going up the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was thinking they're either it's a lack of oxygen or uh, or they just really don't like each other or something. But uh. that's why like like amateur observations are still actually really valued uh, in the scientific community. Like yeah. uh, I'm in I'm an ambassador for the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and uh, because of of that battle over time on the few major telescopes that are out there and yeah. battle for dollars and things like that. Um, they actually rely on the amateur community a lot of the time to do follow-up observations on exoplanet candidates and variable star candidates and uh, like a recurrent novae and all kinds of stuff. And we contribute millions of observations per year. Um, and they're used by by professional scientists in, in their analyses of variable stars and stuff like that. So, those pro amp collaborations have probably not you know there's probably more opportunity now than there yes. ever has been. You know? Yeah, because like especially with CMOS cameras and um, yep. uh, access to better tracking mounts, better design telescope designs, things like that. There's mm -hmm. you can go pr you can go pretty deep with with amateur equipment. Uh, I've imaged on a on a C14, actually with a CCD camera, I imaged a magnitude 19 Nova wow. in like Bortle wow. 5 skies, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, you can go quite deep and, and also the CCD, the CCD camera had has big juicy massive pixels, but um, you know, with, with the sensitivity of CMOS cameras, you know, it lets us get that deep in shorter exposures and then be able to follow higher cadence uh, variable stars and things like that. So yeah, tons of opportunity. We're, we just sent our um, contribution in to AABSO as a gold sponsor today. And oh, wow. uh, th oh, nice. that is a great organization. The um, AAVSO net, we, yeah. we donated, we donated our software and the whole thing runs on our software. And uh, so, and the APAS project, that made the catalog yeah. that was all done with our scheduler. It could not, Arnie Hendon will tell you that you, it could not have been done without the scheduler because it was a huge hundreds of thousands of observations and it was all hands off. So, yeah, you know, we, we kind of, we love the double AVSO and it is our favorite 
favorite thing of anything, really. We love it. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, once once I kind of get my my science rig in a stable configuration, I'm, I'm repairing one of my older mounts right now that uh, will do a better job at tracking with my heavy Newtonia stuff like that. But once I kind of get it stabilized, um, I, it's I've been asked if if uh, I might be interested in putting my scope on the AAVSO net. So. Um, I might have it do that part time or something like that because I get quite a few clear nights here in the bay. So well, you could be a bright star monitor. You could run that, yeah, and that that true. is a that's a good deal. And that when once you start contributing to as a as a BSM station, you'll end up running our software because we donated it to the whole AA VSO net for that purpose. Awesome. Yeah, I've used it a little bit with uh, well the, on the C14 that I did image the Nova with uh, the. The, the guy who I collaborated with out there uses it to, to run a scope. So I was able to, to queue up the targets I wanted to image remotely and stuff like that. So that was pretty cool. Cool. Clearlight58 says, I joined AAVSO after the president of the organization gave a talk at my astronomy club. Nice. They're right down the street from where we meet at the Harvard Smithsonian Observatory in Cambridge. Cool. Nice place to meet. That's great. Yeah, dang. <laughs> That's cool. Very historic. That's awesome. Yeah, I got recruited into AAVSO when I got to meet um, Dr. Stella Kafka, who's their director. Uh, when I was I was connected to her via a friend of mine back when I lived in the Midwest, who was like, "She's a female PhD. You're trying to get your PhD. Y'all should talk." <laughs> and I uh, I told her, talk, told her about how I was wanting to get into scientific observing, but didn't really know where to start. And uh, she got me hooked up with with some people in AAVSO to help me get started. So, yeah. She's a total dynamo. She's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's great. We'll have to get her on our show sometime. Yeah. She she comes on. She's been on the Astro Imaging Channel, um, and then she does she does uh, uh, you know stuff with AAVSO all the time. So um, I'm sure you could get her to come on. I hope so. I hope so. Um, I was trying to think of some shows that we have coming up. Uh, we already talked about the uh, Astronomy Magazine uh, will be co-hosting an event, a uh, Global Star Party here. So we're looking at a couple of weeks out. Um, so, you know, a lot of the editors and contributors will be uh, part of that show. Um, uh, the, um, we have David Kipping, who is a researcher at Columbia uh, university and he is studying exo moons around exoplanets so that he'll be giving a talk which would be very cool um we have uh linda spilker uh, uh who is the uh you know principal uh scientist at uh, on the cassini mission uh will be uh visiting us at one point so we just need to pin down a date but she's agreed to do it um so we have a lot of really interesting um programs coming up, a lot more global star parties, of course. And, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to, uh, uh, you know, just the stuff that comes out of these is just awesome. And I really appreciate you guys being on today. Is there anything else that, um, that you guys would like to share before we uh, wind it up? Everybody have a good one. Hope you have some clear skies to check out the stars. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I haven't had clear skies in a month. <laughs> in a month. Oh, Since boy. Skies your way, okay? So yeah. well, that's great. Well, I want to thank the audience, too. Lots of interesting comments and questions. And um, uh, we will be on, I'm taking uh, tomorrow off. I have to do some personal things, but I'll be back on on Thursday. And, um, and until that time, uh, um, you know, keep looking up. Oh, one other thing I did want to mention too, is that, uh, and I might've mentioned it earlier, is that we are going to be broadcasting the Winter Star Party. And they are using uh, our, uh, our website to do that, uh, that, you know, as a place to go and, and watch that program. So um, uh, you can go to uh, explorescientific.com forward slash winter star party 
there's a link there and you can go and uh, sign up for Winter Star Party, which is going to run like four nights starting, um, I think it's February 8th, uh, and uh, maybe more nights than that. And um, uh, um, it's free. So that's, that's the great part of it. You're going to see some lectures from some of the iconic astronomers. Tippi Diorio will be giving. They'll be replaying some of his uh, talks. Um, I'm sure you'll see uh, stuff from... Um, you know, Mike Reynolds and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps Don Parker and some of these others that uh, unfortunately are no longer with us, but uh, uh, we're huge contributors to our community and uh, as well as new speakers as well. So I'm excited about that. Um, and uh, I guess uh, until Thursday, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you then. OK, good night, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you Scott. Everybody. succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.